Good evening, everyone. I see everybody's on the dais. Happy holidays. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the town council meeting. This is December 21st, 2023. I see 702 on the clock. Uh, town clerk and clerk for the roll call, please. Councilors Bloom. Here. Burdick. Present. Clark. Here. Crow. Here. Levesque. Here. Ludkey. Here. Mendes. Here. Neary. Here. Penn. Here. Schnepp. Here. Starr. Here. Tamish. Here. Turkelson. Here. That is 13. Thank you. And uh, just before we uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, I just, um, if we can do the Pledge of Allegiance and please remain standing, and then I'm gonna hand the microphone over to uh, Councillor Paula Schnepp, who's gonna handle the moment of silence tonight. So if we could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today, December 21st, is the shortest day of the year and the longest night of the year. Across the nation, it is also the day and evening that we commemorate the lives of individuals who have been lost from complications of homelessness. In our community this year, we are remembering close to 60 individuals who died while homeless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now it is time for public comment. Uh, anyone in the hearing room here uh, would like to speak during public comment. If you could please come to the podium, state your name, sign in, and if you could try to keep it under three minutes, that would be great, please. Thank you. Good evening, President Levesque and counselors. My name is Suzanne Conley and I live in Osterville. I wish to read a few lines from an act authorizing the town of Barnstable to grant an easement to Park City Wind, which was approved by the Massachusetts legislature on August 3rd, 2022, from section one. Notwithstanding any general or specific law to the contrary, the town council of the city known as the town of Barnstable may grant to Park City Wind LLC and its successors permanent easements in certain parcels of land namely a portion of Craigville Beach, May Grant. From section two, Park City Wind LLC shall provide mitigation for the granting of such an easement pursuant to the host community agreement entered into between the city known as the town of Barnstable and Park City Wind dated May 6, 2022, provided that such mitigation shall consist of a $100,000 payment to the town of Barnstable to be used for the benefit of and improvements to Craigville Beach or to purchase or improve other Article 97 protected land. From Section 3, the town manager of the town of Barnstable may execute and record any instruments necessary on behalf of the town to effectuate the transfer authorized in Section 1. You have the power and the authority in your hands. And I wanted to point that out. Last week, I attended the five and a half hour EFSB hearing that resulted in their approval of the Park City Wind Project, while in my opinion, treating the town of Barnstable very badly. On Thursday, I attended a meeting in Boston that featured a panel comprised of three offshore wind company executives, including Ken Kimmel and the president of the Environmental League of Massachusetts. I heard the legitimate concerns of citizens groups dismissed as non-issues and misinformation. I am more motivated than ever to continue the fight. I want to wish you and yours a happy holiday season. Thank you for your patience with me over the past year and for teaching me to say what I have to say in three minutes or less. Thank you. We so appreciate you. Thank you, Ms. Conley.
Good evening, council members. My name is Barry Scheingold. I'm a resident of Marston's Mills. I'm here to speak on the Park City Wind Project. I was formerly a consultant in the electric power industry until I retired a year ago. I served as lead of the independent evaluator team for the first three offshore wind procurements conducted by the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources and the Commonwealth's electric distribution companies. I currently serve on the town's infrastructure and energy committee, but I'm here speaking for myself. As you move forward in deciding how to, res how to act with respect to the project, especially in the context of the Energy Facility Siting Board's recent order of approval, I ask that you strongly consider the following. First, the threat of climate change and the need to address it. Three years ago, the town council adopted a policy that stated in part that due to the threat posed by global climate change to the health, safety, and economic security of the residents of the town of Barnstable, the town of Barnstable hereby adopts as its policy the objective of reducing net greenhouse gas emissions from human activity within and by the town to zero to the extent technically and economically feasible. This policy is in line with the Commonwealth's policy, effectuated through a series of legislative acts, regulations, and executive actions to make reducing greenhouse gas emissions the largest contributor to climate change a top priority. The proposed project would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by over one and a half million tons per year regionally, equivalent to taking over 300,000 cars a year off the road. I can't think of anything that this town could do that would have a more positive impact in mitigating climate change than supporting the wind projects. Second, let's focus on what the real potential adverse impacts of the project are likely to be and how they will be managed. For example, after developing an ample record over three and a half years, the siding board found that the modeled magnetic forces from underground cables to be installed are far below magnetic field safety thresholds established by international bodies and are comparable to or substantially below those of other projects previously approved by the siting board. So the risk to public health appears to be minimal to none, and the modeled results can be confirmed by actual tests. Like Vineyard Wind at Cobles Beach, use of horizontal directional drilling at Craigville Beach should produce no adverse environmental impacts. The planned substation is based on, as the town has described it, industry-leading protocols, design standards, and other protections for the town's water supply that were in large part negotiated by the town with PCW as part of the host community agreement. Included are multiple stringent levels of containment to handle any dielectrical fluid spills. So the risk to water supply appears to be well managed and in accord with the town's requirements when it entered into the HCA. Like other residents who have spoken out, I am not an environmental expert. But I find comfort in the fact that all of the environmental groups that commented before the siting board, including those who were active in the review process, supported approval of the project. This includes the Association for the Preservation of Cape Cod and the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition, which are strongly focused on water quality. <clears throat> I also find comfort in the thorough review process conducted by the siting board over a three and a half year period. Finally, the town should honor the host community agreement, which includes the town's commitment to support Park City Wind in various ways. The HCA has been a vehicle to obtain benefits and protections that would not or might not have been obtainable through the regulatory process such as the $16 million in payments and the higher level of design for the substation. I call upon the town and Park City Wind to address any outstanding issues through dialogue with each other to make the project better and allay citizen concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shanhold.
Hi, my name is Natalie Pittenger. I live at Nine Schooner Lane in Hyannis. Um, and I'm just here tonight, I just want to say a few words in support of Felicia Penn for president of the town council. Um, Felicia is a native resident who grew up here and has been serving the town of Brownstable in various uh, capacities for many years. Uh, she is skilled and knowledgeable in all things Barnstable. I believe she is just the type of leadership that the residents of Barnstable so desperately need. Um, oh, and by the way, did I mention that she's also very smart? Uh, the voters spoke volumes in the last election and are clearly looking for new and effective leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pinger. My name is Denise Johnson. I'm a resident of Hyannis. Um, I'm here tonight. I want to uh, follow Natalie in talking about Felicia's candidacy for president. Um, I got to know Felicia about 18 months ago, and really immediately we had a lot in common. And I'd like to think I'm one of the people that convinced her to run for town council. Her biggest reluctance was that it might slow down the work she was doing on the planning commission. But as many of us told her, there's not going to be a plan executed if we don't have leadership. And so with that, she decided to throw her hat in the ring. I agreed to canvas for Felicia, which was totally intimidating to me. I hate going door to door. I hate people thinking I'm there to sell them something. So with the camouflage of my two toy poodles, I set out in her very diverse uh, precinct, a uh, diversity of economy, of ethnicity, of um, all kinds of things, politi politics. And uh, I found that my work was going to be one of the easiest afternoons and we we had days to follow because everyone knows Felicia. I met her, a woman who was in her mother's Girl Scout troop. I met her classmates. I met people that remember her as a youngster working in the family store. And they not only knew Felicia, they loved Felicia. I felt like my sales skills were intact. I didn't have to worry. And I'd like to say that I have met many in my career um, with several large organizations. I've met a lot of smart people. I've met a lot of great leaders. But with Felicia, I see an ability to take a very complex set of issues and be inclusive to all sides of the subject and come out with a direct plan. I thought of her yesterday when they referred to Sandra Day O'Connor as a get it done mom and a get it done legislature, uh, uh, Chief Justice. And I thought, I think of Felicia as someone who could get things done. I think she has the courage. I think she is for tro total transparency and bringing the people back into this government. I mean, I think she wants to run an, uh, a, a town council that's for the people, by the people. And I think she'd be an excellent choice in our election later tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Well, good evening, counselors. Uh, thank you for your service to our community. My name is Catherine Campos Ledeck. I live in the village of Barnstable. I bring to you extensive experience updating comprehensive plan documents and urban design guidelines, natural resources management, housing, transportation, budget, a lot of other things too. But for the benefit of those of you who did not attend nor yet watched the last meeting of the joint committees of the Planning Board and the Hyannis Main Street Waterfront Historic District Commission on December 11, I share with you here my recommendations as a result of what happened at that meeting. While the Planning Board voted to adopt the Urban Design Guidelines, the Hyannis Main Street Waterfront Historic District Commission, their vote to adopt failed. Thus, the guidelines, as far as I can understand it, will not be adopted, and the 2012, the 2012 urban design guidelines will remain in effect until such time as the draft document can be updated and reintroduced for another vote of the joint committee. I, I don't know when that's going to happen. Now we're in a position where development projects are coming forward for your review and approval. And, oh, by the way, we don't have any updated urban design guidelines. We're still working with the ones from 2012. 
So we don't know how these projects will fit in with our vision for what the high end is Main Street and waterfront area should include. This is a problem. Why? Because now we have development that is not well coordinated and may or may not fit with our historic or other urban design elements that should be part of our vision. Development and redevelopment will occur one site at a time. How will this be coordinated? How will design elements unify the sense of place? This is not clear. So we are behind in expressing our vision. This puts us at a disadvantage when working to attract investment in our community. I recommend that a concentrated effort be pursued over the next few months with the joint committees, staff, and interested public to rework and finish the urban design guidelines for the Hyannis Main Street and Waterfront area. I prepared a list of missing elements that I identified. There were others that were detailed at the meeting. I'll distribute this at the end of the meeting. Too much to cover here. I only get three minutes, you know. Further, I recommend that the urban design guidelines be prepared for each of the villages in the town of Barnstable. What we don't want is uncoordinated development that doesn't reflect our vision for what each of the villages wants. I recommend that you ask staff to identify what is needed to prepare urban design guidelines for each of the villages. We need this in order to attract investment in our villages and in our community. And oh, by the way, developers need this to understand our vision. Without this, we might continue to have vacant spaces in our villages and community where vibrant businesses and residents through new housing could be thriving. Thank you for your consideration of these recommendations, and I want to take a moment to wish you all a very happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want, yes, if you want to hand those to the town clerk, she can hand them on to us. Great. Thank you very much for your investment and your participation. So. Kathy's a woman who can get it done, so I would strongly encourage you to move her into an official capacity, either on the LCP or the planning <coughs> department, because she, um, I'm sorry. Uh, Kathy can get it done also, so I strongly recommend that you consider her for committee assignment. Ms. Schwab, did you say your name? I'm sorry. Oh, you said my name. Thank you very much. Make sure you sign in too, please. Thank you very Thank much. You. So I prepared notes. Uh, which I probably won't use, but uh, I had the opportunity to interact with a number of committees over the last several months trying to fill a gap in our planning process, which was the absence of design guidelines. Now, it's very difficult to get in front of a moving train and say, hey, wait a minute, you're missing something. Uh, it's even harder when the town's planning department and the town's legal staff are not supporting you as a citizen and are not giving you guidance. There seems to be plenty of guidance being offered the Business Improvement District, but not the citizens. So I need you to really, really consider how we're going to get done these design guidelines, not just for Hyannis, but for all the villages. So what is the process that we need to go through? And it may be that we have to look at the appointments committee, after you're done electing a president and a vice president, I hope you would turn your attention to the appointments committee and start to vet candidates who want to get something done and care about the town and aren't just representing business interests, but actually representing the residents of the town. Because we have opinions too, and we're not being heard. And you saw that on Monday night when we weren't even given three minutes. So if you're so afraid of the citizens that you won't even let them talk for three minutes, then what does that say about the community we live in? Right? Is that right? I don't think it was. Whatever happened on uh, Monday, you need to take a look at that because we can do better. Thank you very much. Good evening, friends. My name is John Julius. <clears throat> For the record, I've already signed in. 
So Monday night, yeah, let's talk about Monday night. You talk about a travesty. You talk about an injustice. Here, let me read the definition of due process. And I don't care how many lawyers follow me to this podium in the next half hour, two hours. I don't care. I'm not going to listen to what they have to say. I can understand law just like they can. Due process, fair treatment through the ju normal judicial system, especially as a citizen's entitlement. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm one of those three appellants that wound up on the front page of the Cape Cod Times today. And it's a travesty what happened. And what happened was we didn't even have two seconds to speak because the town attorney's office in this building, who seemingly could care less about residents and citizens, took it upon themselves to write a written legal opinion. You know who writes written legal opinions? Courts and judges. I can tell you that I saw, and it was after the fact, you talk about, you talk about unfairness. I saw a letter dated December 14th from the town attorney's office. And in that letter, four-page letter, which wasn't signed by anyone that I could see, she cited or they cited some 10 or 12 cases, okay? I have case law myself right here. And I also saw a letter dated the next day, the 15th, from the developer's own attorney, okay? And so I'd like to know, was there any correspondence between them back and forth? Why didn't myself and the other two appellants see the copies of those letters rather than come into this building with 25 or so people, sit in the back room here, and then have the appeals committee read a simple sentence that, sorry, the town attorney feels that you have no standing. I have news for you. There is a case in case law in the Massachusetts Appellate Court from 2018. It was called the Montgomery versus Nantucket Board of Selectmen. And here's what it basically stated in essence, that the Massachusetts Appellate Court stated that Montgomery, that was the person looking for standing, can be, standing can be based upon both an individualized injury that includes visual impacts from abutting properties in public places by quote unquote, individuals who d demonstrate a legitimate concern for protecting the integrity of the, a historic district. That's where I live, right down the street. I'm, I don't have standing, oh yes I do, and if we were in a court of law, I bet the judge would find that. The other thing that I didn't even have the chance to say was, the town owns the parking lot that abuts that building. I happen to be a taxpayer like the other two appellants. As far as I'm concerned, I do have standing because I pay taxes and the town owns the parking lot, but that's for another day, that's, that's for a higher court. The, the last thing that I would like to, to, to basically tell you is that if I can, you could, with all due respect, my Christmas present, I guess, might be an extra minute. But nevertheless, I would just simply read this to you. And this came from that Supreme Court, that Massachusetts Appellate Court case. Finally, it should be noted, quote unquote, a review of standing based on all the evidence does not require that the fact finder ultimately find a plaintiff's allegations meritorious. To do so would deny standing after the fact to any unsuccessful plaintiff. Rather, the plaintiff must put, must put forth credible evidence to substantiate his or her allegations. In this context, standing then essentially becomes a question of fact for the trial judge, not for the town attorney's office in this building, and not for any developer's attorney who wants to go and waltz their own interpretation. Here's the last thing I'll leave, and, and again, I thank you for the extra time here. No judicial or quasi-judicial body like the committee designed to hear appeals is supposed to make a first and last unilateral announcement without giving parties the opportunity to be heard. I didn't feel like I was in America the other night, and if this is the way you want to run the town of Barnstable, if I'm sitting in your shoes, I'd have a talk with the town attorney's office here and tell them to treat the citizens a hell of a lot better than we were on Monday night. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Julius. President Levesque. Yes, sir. I have a public comment when, when, the, when they're done. Yes, of course.
Bob Schulte from Centerville. Didn't intend to speak tonight, but just wanted to address the election tonight. I just uh, hope that you all support Felicia Penn for president, Craig Tamish for vice president. Um, I support those comments that have been made about Felicia beforehand, but I'd also like to support Craig as my precinct four counselor as vice president. I think the uh, recent election results have shown that uh, there's a, a need for change in town and support for that change, and I think that starts at the top with leadership, and I just want to say I support them both and hope you do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schulte. Uh, good evening, counselors, and, uh, and happy holidays. Uh, my name, again, is Rob Brennan. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, solely in my capacity as a uh, resident of Barnstable, um, property owner in Hyannis and, and, and taxpayer. Um, I am just going to read something to, to supplement uh, the record that was entered by a gentleman a couple ago, and that's the uh, definition of person aggrieved. Uh, under Mass General Laws Chapter 40C, which is the chapter under which uh, our town historic districts um, were established. And this person aggrieved uh, establishes the, the criteria uh, for standing. So straight from the, the statute, it says person aggrieved means either the applicant, an owner of adjoining property, um, an owner of property within the same historic district and within 100 feet of the said property in question, or a charitable corporation uh, in which one of its purposes is the preservation of historic structures and districts. There were three appellants uh, on Monday night, uh, the closest of which was 33 times that 100 foot uh, standing guideline and outside of the district. The next of which was 1.82 miles away or 96 times that 100 foot district uh, standing threshold, and the third of which was 168 times outside that 100 foot radius at 3.19 miles. Uh, all of these addresses uh, were on the cover sheets. So that was uh, shown, uh, and that was uh, grounds. But I mention this <clears throat> because it's an illustration of the challenge that's going to be before this council and I think the challenge that's going to be before the leadership of this council, and that's recognizing the legitimate issues, the tough challenges ahead of us, and being prepared to roll up your sleeves uh, and do that hard work, uh, that hard work on renewable energy, um, that hard work on our water quality, uh, but most importantly, that hard work on our housing and how do we provide housing uh, for those first responders, those teachers, those people that make our town run and who we count on and who year after year, 1,000 families are being driven off Cape Cod because they can no longer afford to live here. Uh, and maybe those 1,000 aren't all here in Barnstable, but a big chunk of them are every year. And that's the challenge before us. And it's separating the wheat from the chaff, um, the deliberate distractions and the efforts to stand in the way of developing housing, to stand in the way of building toward a Barnstable for 2053 and tying us back to a Barnstable of 1953. So I hope tonight when it comes to voting for leadership um, that the counselors vote for leaders who have the experience uh, to understand what it means on the council to roll up your sleeves and do the hard work to vote for leaders that are inclusive, to vote for leaders that represent the folks that are not in this room and will never be in this room because they don't consider themselves represented, but yet they have to be represented. So I urge the counselors in making your decision for president to vote for those leaders who can take this town forward and can be inclusive and who understand the need to roll up our sleeves on serious issues and to recognize distractions when they come before the council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Oh, 
I'll sign in first. Good evening. My name is Larry Morin. I'm a member, of, uh, not a member of anything right now. Uh, I uh, was for a long time. Uh, I uh, live in Katuit, and I'm here on behalf of both uh, Felicia and Craig. But more importantly, I'm here on behalf of the entire council and the community. Uh, I mapped out a series of things I was going to say, but I'm going to go to a different approach. Uh, this is about leadership, and what is leadership is based upon how different people perceive it, and it's clearly based upon what your experience may have been or what you may have read. Felicia has experience in a wide variety. So does Craig. Uh, so do many of the other new members of this council. Uh, the, my concern is not just mine, but it's the concern of many other people, and that is that the election and the campaigning process that eight new members of this community got into. Six of them were elected, but in the process, they went door to door and they learned a lot from the door knocking as to what people thought. A lot of what they thought is that they don't get any recognition at all. And if they do, it's so minuscule or irrelevant that it doesn't even count. This group, led by Felicia, is focused on that. It's focused on communicating. It's focused on hearing what issues are concerned. This very session we're having now, the public comment, this is the only body in the town that considers that on a routine basis, and I value that. But you don't begin to use it properly. You don't begin to use it. When a question comes up, get an answer to the person that raised the question. Don't just sit there and nod your head. That has not been done. That's what leadership's about. You follow up. You delegate, you communicate, and you balance the issues. There's no bullying, there's no insulting, none of that has to occur. If that occurs, there's no leadership. Now, when it comes to Felicia, uh, the issues were raised, few people raised the question that unless you've been an incumbent or been on the council, you should not be eligible to be a member or, excuse me, become an officer. There's nothing in the guidelines, rules, anything in this town that says that. But the people that have come before this council that are new, they bring a load, bucket loads of experience in many different things. They may have leadership skills that far outweigh some of you that are sitting here. And because you don't discuss it. We could, we could go through all 13 of you and give me a resume, tell me what you've done. That's gonna, that's gonna be shown by what you do when you're sitting at that dais. And in my regard, therefore, I support Felicia I support Craig, and I support all of you to join together, put, identify the, what Mr. Brennan just said. Just, I don't agree with his view, but I agree with what he itemized. There are many issues you have to deal with, but I think that those of uh, Felicia's capable, Craig's facial, Betty's capable, Kristen's capable, Paul couldn't be capable if he puts his mind to it. Okay? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Good. Okay, but that's what I'm talking about, and that's what I want to see you do. And, John, you can really be effective, no question about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Roberta Mock, uh, 80 Greenwood Avenue. I'm so glad to be part of this process, and I'm so proud of everyone who's working so hard to make our town to find our weaknesses and fix what needs to be fixed because all across America, our farmlands are being um, under attack by developers who ha do not have the same um, priorities that we have for our town. Um, all across America, towns are being um, bullied I was bullied in the stairwell at that meeting by an attorney. Said I, I that I'm never right. That I mean I, I'm sorry. I try my hardest to say what I think needs to be said. Our water. I went to the PFA meeting at the airport. Um, our water quality 
concerns me because um, we need to collaborate with the um, fire department. Um, all this wonderful data that they, they worked so hard at the airport to get. We need to collaborate with all efforts so that we really make sure that people are safe drinking our water. Um, it's really important to me that we as a town be very careful that our council and our town government, because this is very hard to, it's a, there's a gray line conflict of interest. We have to be very careful that special interest groups do not infect our town government so that the proper process and proper decisions are being made, not the loudest voice not the loudest attorney, not the loudest lobbyist. Okay, I just had to say that. I feel, my opinion is that we need a high density building moratorium short term until we fix this problem of overdevelopment of open space in our precious water aquifer. I feel that we need to roll up our sleeves and find out this housing crisis, we cannot build our way out of a housing crisis. We need to legislate. We need to look at our, our legislation and see what's weak. Where are, we, where are our weaknesses? We have so many brilliant minds here in this room and on Cape Cod. We can do this. We don't need to hire outside sources to tell us what and how we what, how our town should be. I mean, I look at Rockport. They have a very strong historical committee that keeps Rockport historical. I'm very concerned about historical buildings that are under attack in our very village. The Christian Science Church, that beautiful building, I hope they don't tear that down also. I'm very concerned about 307 Main Street that beautiful building before it was added onto, where's the respect for our past? Why can't we respect our past like, like Providence, Rhode Island does? What's wrong? Why are we forgetting how important our past and our history is here, right on our soil here at Cape Cod? Um, I don't know how to do a building moratorium. I would like to get signatures at the transfer station. I don't know how, I don't know the process because I've never gotten involved in government before. I don't know how. I do know I think it's very important that we do take a pause and get this right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Monk. Because I just hate to see, I would really hate to see our open spaces like Twin Brooks decimated. 600 trees gone, all the wild left that I hear at night live there. Where are they going to go? I know, I, I'm going to add this on. NEFSA, the commercial fishermen from Maine to Florida, they are against the wind farm because it, I've heard that they cleared, the reason the whales have been dying is because they cleared the bottom of the ocean. I don't know if that's true, but it does, in, it does interfere with nature, and we have to be careful. The decisions we make right here in this room affect so many of us on the East Coast. I'm concerned about terrorism that weakens us, that, that wind farm weakens us um, to terrorist attacks. We're gonna have to pay to, to make sure that we don't lose our power, or I remember the, the great New England blackout we got a lot to think about, and it's hard, and I'm grateful because I know we, we're going to do a great job. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Monk. Anybody else in the hearing room like to speak during public comment? Would you like to read something from the record, Council of Star? Um, <clears throat> yes, I have a, a public comment from a, a constituent that I like. This, um, this is written by Steve Waller, who is an um, alternative on the Board of Health. Um, and he's not here at the moment, so I'm going to be his voice. Um, <clears throat> as the town council prepares to welcome new members, 
with new energy, I urge you to discuss and improve two practices. First, your agenda setting process is both opaque and last minute. Council members, staff, and citizens can be better prepared for meeting discussions if the agenda were published a week in advance of each meeting. Second, you could get a lot more done if you're appointed citizen advisory committees with specific tasks and paid town support and then delivered a clear response to each advisory committee recommendation. The council is overwhelmed with challenges now. Water quality and climate change policies, for example, need more study and attention. Engaging more citizens with expertise in the town council's business would be healthy for all of us and make the town council more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Council Scott. Anybody else in the hearing room like to speak during public comment? Anybody like to speak remotely? Thank you, we do. We have Sandy Jones. Sandy, you may unmute. You have three minutes. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Am I heard? I can hear you. Oh, great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I am, um, during the last town council meeting on December 7th, town councilor um, Neary mentioned a recent study regarding PFAS in the West Barnstable area. Um, I believe he stated that they were the highest levels in the town of Barnstable. And I'm wondering for one, if this um, study is available to the residents and if it is, where can we have um, find this? And then I'm specifically interested in um, if particular locations were listed as far as the um, highest concentration levels. And um, the reason why I ask this is because of the 661 Oak Street Eversource reliability expansion. Um, there are 18 houses within 1,000 feet of the Eversource um, substation. It was, I believe, the expansion. They've had two expansions since 2012. And, and I'm curious if the residents in that area, if that is the highest level along Oak Street, which I heard, um, should the residents in that area have individual um, well tests? And then secondly, I believe that the town of Barnstable filed for intervening status for their reliability change project. And if they did, could we potentially have testing done before and after just to monitor ourselves to see what's going on with the drinking water in the West Barnstable area? And thank you very much for allowing me to speak, and I wish everyone a happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Happy holiday. Anybody else? There's no one else. Okay, thank you very much. So um, that is um, in double checking the room, making sure. Okay, not seeing anybody. Uh, now time before response to public comment. Looking to my left, anybody like to respond to public comment? Council Neary, please. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for all that spoke tonight. Wow, last meeting of the year. Thought it would be a little light, and maybe you know, wish everybody a ha hope everybody had a happy Hanukkah. We're going to talk about you know, everybody have a Merry Christmas and look forward to the new year. I didn't realize a, a hockey game was going to break out in the middle of this thing, so you know, uh, I appreciate the comments. A little bit heavy, a little bit of vitriol here. Um, I hope this is what we will experience going forward uh, as time goes by. I heard maybe a little tenor of, of uh, comment about maybe what the position is or some of the things that we've accomplished, I feel we've accomplished in the town in terms of engaging the public. I think we can thank sitting President Lebesgue for that. For three years he's been here. I don't know if there's a record. Is there a record of, of how many years someone served as town council president? Is it four? <laughs> that close um, but we should really thank him looking looking back at the time I mean we were deep in COVID uh, the world was a mess there was a lot of moving pieces in terms of actually having meetings whether they were in zoom or whether this uh, this format that we have but it's a new year and I'm going to uh, I'm going to put away some of my my uh, uh, fears because fear doesn't do us any good. 
and uh, a new year brings new things. I hope we can all be respectful, behave, treat each other with, with respect, agree to disagree, because that's really what we're all here for. And, uh, you know, we're blessed to wake up in the morning and wake up. So I don't mean to rant. So let's let that go. I want to thank you for, for the work that you've done for the last three years. I think it's, uh, it's, it's drastically understated. I think uh, you've been engaging, clear. Uh, I, I hear things about our, our, our planning and development staff that just won a, a tremendous award and, and should, should deserve a lot of respect. And I, and I hear a little bit of pushback towards that. So let's all prove each other maybe not quite so right and work together. Uh, rega regarding Sandy Jones, uh, silentsprings.org, if you go to that, that site, you can uh, pull up any information regarding the current status of PFAS. Uh, the report, uh, it's long overdue, actually. I think uh, I know my daughter as well was tested over two years ago, so that those reports have just come out. Uh, I've had conversations with some in, in the public around that particular item. It's very dear to me, water quality and housing. I think we need to really focus on moving forward with this. I, I'm just going to say I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the folks in the room right here have a, have, a, have a roof over their head. And many don't. And many are, are, are in a tough housing spot. So we really need to look, look forward and work together to create some, some help in those areas. But again, uh, Sandy, if you'd like to reach out to, out, out to me uh, directly, if you can't get to that, uh, I'd be happy to help you with it. And, and God bless, and everybody have a wonderful, happy New Year, healthy New Year. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Henry. Councilor Mendes, please. Hey, everybody. And uh, thank everybody for the comments tonight. I just want to talk about housing a little bit because that seems to be a real hot-button issue. Um, as I've said several times, I'm several generations here. My family's been here since the early 1900s. And <clears throat> when I was coming up during the building boom of the 80s, the same, they were saying the same thing that a lot of people are saying here that wouldn't allow a lot of you people that are here that have moved here to move here. But the thing that's different now is that every town department is working under capacity. Every contractor in town is looking for help. We do not have enough people here to sustain what we have. So we have a choice. We can either pretty much die as a town, or we can progress as a town. I don't like the building and all that just like the next person. I don't like it. This isn't the cape that I know, but this is the cape that it is. We have no choice. We are understaffed at our hospital. We can't keep help at our hospitals, so we have a choice to make. Either we import all the labor, so the money that comes from the people here, they spend in their communities off cape, or we can be self-sustained. That's the choice we have. Like I said before, I used to ride motorcycles from Marston's Mills to Howitch, from Marston's Mills to Falmouth. I was 14 years old driving my father's car to the cash market. That's the cape I remember, but that cape is gone. And unfortunately, this, these are the choices that we have. I don't like it, but I'm not adverse to it because that's just the reality of it. Everybody have a blessed Christmas and happy Hanukkah. Thank you, Council Mendes. Anybody else on my left like to say anything? Council Penn, please. Very quickly, um, I want to thank everybody who feels so passionate about um, some of the key issues that um, the town is engaged in. And I hope you don't stop coming and communicating with us. And I hope that there are, are uh, there's more opportunity for um, public input. And um, we'll talk about that later. So thank you. Thank you, Council Penn. Anybody to my right like to speak during uh, response to public comment? 
Council Lucky, please. Yes, I'd like to echo a little bit of what uh, Councillor Penn said. Um, thank you all so much for commenting. What's, what terrific comments. And I think if there's a common thread, it has to do with, with planning and responsiveness to the public. You know, from Suzanne Conley, who started us out, um, we've been tracing back, you know, how did we get here? And I think a lot of the comments tonight are in that similar vein. And I think we can address them here and now and hopefully with uh, the new leadership and as we have discussions at the end of the meeting about what people are bringing to the table, that's what I'm going to be listening for, is how are we going to address these? And uh, Larry Morin, um, you brought up some good kind of institutional and similar to what Steve Waller said. Uh, Gordon, thank you for reading that. In terms of uh, some of the uh, structure of the town council and perhaps some subordinate committees that might help us tackle this. Uh, several of our speakers talked about rolling, rolling our sleeves up and, and getting to work. And certainly if we, if we had had better planning, and, and Kathy Ledeck, it's always just a pleasure to listen to you. Your, your breadth of knowledge is just absolutely incredible. And I think we wouldn't be at such odds with each other if we did better planning. Um, I'm a huge planner, a, a big fan of it. Um, we've mentioned the award that was given, but we wouldn't be in this situation. We wouldn't have people going to an appeals committee if we'd done our planning a little bit better. Um, we did the Main Street a zoning change, but we didn't, didn't have the guidelines ready. And for those of us, I, I count myself as one who's gone to those historic Main Street meetings, and, and Kathy uh, said it, you know, we're just hurting ourselves and the developers to not have this right. So let, let's get it right. Um, it was uh, Felicia Penn a few meetings ago who, who made the football analogy that we've got a foul, let's a, throw a flag down and call a timeout and, and get this right. And again, um, much more discussion as we head to the elections, but uh, just wonderful comments from everyone. I, I so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor King. Anybody else? Councillor Crow, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I haven't taken a side on Main Street Project. I, I have to learn a lot more about it before I uh, make any comments. But I was surprised by the open and closed nature of the appeals committee meeting. That was based on watching many of our appeals bodies here, such as the ZBA. I have no memory of seeing a body that hears appeals read read a legal conclusion and close a hearing without giving the parties the chance to speak to the legal conclusion and the chance to argue their view of the law. I'd like to hear from the town attorney whether the ZBA and other appeals bodies announce legal opinions and close hearings and how frequently that has happened. We have citizens who bring an appeal to a board. It seems like a matter of good process or at the very least courtesy that we offer them a brief opportunity to be heard. It's possible that parties who come before the appeals boards have points of law that might be right and hearing them out would prove useful to all involved. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Crow. Anybody else? Councilor Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, again, thanks to all who came out tonight. It's very cold and windy out there, so hope you have a safe journey home. Um, but I, I did want to uh, thank in particular Mr. Scheingold for coming and bringing a, a different perspective than we've heard on some of these important issues that are before us uh, regarding wind energy and to put it in the larger context of what we're experiencing um, in our climate, in our very uh, extreme weather events that we've been having both here and other places in the country. So I again, and, and a reminder that the town council has moved forward with um, making a commitment to try to reduce our greenhouse emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Schnapp. Councilor Crow, did you want to, did you want to answer that question at, the, at this moment? No. Or, or some, okay, just making sure. Okay, I just I was gonna ask, just making sure. Um, and then, is there anybody else that like to speak, response to COVID comment? I just want to say thank you for everybody who has participated, um, either in person or remotely. Um, and again, just, uh, you know, uh, I think it's important that, you know, as we get this and, um, you know, obviously the extra minute or whatever it takes to, to get someone's point across has never really been a problem. Um, I do appreciate for those who try to do make it under that uh, to give everybody an opportunity, um, uh, especially when it might be a heavy agenda. Uh, 
But I, again, I appreciate everybody. And, and again, if you're ever looking for an answer, sometimes you, just because you don't get an answer right away, um, reach out to your counselor and um, make sure that if you're not getting an answer over the diet, sometimes it's a heavy question and no one wants to give the wrong answer. So what they do, I know for myself, is I'll pause, write something down, and then I'll privately reach out to somebody and try to get them that answer. And uh, but again, if and especially um, as new leadership goes into place, you know, follow up, make sure that your question gets answered, and it's not that you're not uh, heard or listened to, I should say. But um, sometimes the response takes a little bit more time to make sure you get the the correct answer and not just a boilerplate um, type answer. So um, again, appreciate everybody's uh, input in regards to that, and you know, um, anytime we move forward with something, uh, you know, zoning. Uh, any type of thing where we're trying to solve um, a problem, so to speak, and it's not always an easy solution. And um, you know, this is a refinery, so to speak, and as it needs to move forward, I, I really replace, uh, appreciate Ms. Catherine's comments in regards to that, and you offering your expertise um, to the different, you know, the local comprehensive plan committee coming out to the planning. I, I couldn't agree with you more. We really need that blueprint. We need that predictability uh, for, for people to come and redevelop, especially blighted, undeveloped properties is what we're trying to do. So if we can get that consensus as quickly as possible and move forward, in, um, and, and that's what we're trying to do, and it's a step-by-step -step process, so I appreciate you being part of that solution, because that is what you're offering. You're offering real solutions. So thank you for those who are participating and offering real solutions, and um, we'll continue to try to make something, you know, um, the process more perfect. So thank you again. So with that, that would close the public comment, a response to public comment, and uh, now it would be time for town manager to discuss the town manager communications. So the town manager's report has been pre-recorded and is available to town council and the public. The report will be prepared in written form and posted on the town manager website as in the past. The town manager and staff will be available to answer any questions regarding the report as presented. The town manager's communication for the period of December 7th through December 20th, 2023 includes an update on, number one, an update on the budget action calendar, number two, updated on public comment period closing relative to proposed dog control regulations, number three, update on sewer connection policy approved by Board of Health, number four, response prepared by Barnstable Legal Department regarding the Energy Facilities Siting Board, also known as the EFSB, hearing on December 11, 2023. Number five, update on use of opioid litigation funds. And number six, update from Kelly Colopy, Communications Manager for the Public Works Department on Water Resource Management Planning, including the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. So with that, I would kick back to the council and ask the council if they have any questions for our town manager or through our town manager, any of the staff. Looking to my right. Council Starr. Thank you. Um, my question is about the, um, the Board of Health regulations, um, the policy deadline to connect buildings to public sewers. Is this, um, does this come before us or is this just the Board of Health? Okay. So. Welcome Town Manager Rells. <clears throat> Good evening, Mark Els, Town Manager. Um, it, is a Board of Health regulation, therefore Board of Health. So are there any um, penalties if you, don't, if you don't hook up to sewer? What, what happens, I mean, it says, it says you have to hook up in six months. What happens if people don't hook up? Extension. I'd have to come back to you with the answer. Um, is that a Board of Health question? Or is I, it, it is a Board of Health question, but I don't have their regulations relevant to not following the regulation in front of me. So. They've been working on this for a long time. Correct. Um, so um, I, don't know, there, I have other questions. So I, um, like section D doesn't seem to fit. Um, so uh, if you have an innovative alternative system, it seems like you're allowed to keep that. Ask for an extension if you provide yearly monitoring information. You, uh, again, um, it would be better if you wrote down any questions okay. that you may have. Okay. Um, and then I can bring them, I can take them myself or have Public Works bring them to uh, Board of Health 
and we can also review internally with staff those questions. <clears throat> okay. I mean, hopefully we've learned some things from Stewart's Creek years ago. But okay. Thank you. Okay. I will. I'll write them. Done. Thank you, Council Starr. Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you very much, Town Manager. <clears throat> um, and I know that you have received, as have I, um, comments on the dog regulations. So um, you say it's under advisement. About the time, what, you, what timeline do you expect to um, resolve that? And how will the people know that it's changed? Modified. I believe that we're going to take a modified draft version of it and post it so that people can look at it. Um, I believe that the modifications in general um, have taken into account the questions. Much of the time frame uh, use of beaches, specific beaches that the state has identified as rare and endangered species habitat, we're trying to allow, rather than having a set fixed closure date, we want to leave it to staff to work with the state to see if we can keep those beaches open for longer periods. Um, but as much as people may agree or disagree, um, we're not going to violate the Rare and Endangered Species Act. And so in many cases, I think there's at least five beaches that may be looking at more extended um, days of limited or no accessibility to people with dogs on the beach. But that's that's the primary change that, that's in there. Um, Follow-up, Council Clark. Thank you. And if I may uh, make a suggestion, can you please include in when that draft document comes out the justification? Because as you and I had spoken, I thought that some areas were closed due to water quality, and it was indeed incorrect. It was in regard to the um, response to the endangered species. And if the public knows that, it might save them and us a few phone calls. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Yes, we've tried to do that, and, and certainly, um, you know, uh, Nina Coleman has tried to respond directly to everybody that's emailed, and there seems to be a lot of confusion relevant to, you know, why we would uh, limit walking your dog on the beach. Um, there's some argument about whether it's a, if they've seen rare and endangered species, but it's not, we don't designate that, the state designates it. Um, but yes, we will do our best to continue. I know we've done recordings and aired them. Um, we've responded directly. I, I almost want to say Nina's responded to to close to 100 um, emails that we've received. And I have no idea how many verbal inquiries. Um, and we will continue to do so. Uh, so, yes. Councilor Tamish, please. I wanted to commend the Board of Health for their inclusion of the innovative and alternate systems. Uh, I, I've got some questions on that. And people that have made a significant investment in doing what they think is best for their property and the removal of nitrogen and other pollutants uh, uh, potentially could have been punished and forced to abandon a very expensive system. So the fact that that's in there and they can get a waiver I think is a great thing. Thank you. And again, I, the authority falls to the Board of Health, so I am, I am, I really don't want to answer their questions. I do believe, though, that this has been long in coming. Um, perhaps at some point in the future, a joint meeting with your Board of Health, um, given that we're embarking on a multi-year um, comprehensive wastewater management plan, um, that the regulations have changed, that innovative alternative systems are part of the solution, but um, I think it needs to be understood whether they get you to the regulatory targets that are being imposed on the town of Barnstable. Um, the fact that we've adopted an adaptive approach, which wasn't required by the regulators, it was something that you know, our public works and our finance departments and, and others recommended giving the changing environment around wastewater 
um, and, and water resource, wastewater treatment and water resource protection. Um, so I would offer to, to future leadership that that sort of meeting with Board of Health would probably be something you might want to consider. We're also always available, and we could have health um, represented uh, at a meeting in a workshop format, certainly, if the council wants to go back and forth and ask various questions. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Tom Angelos. Any other questions to my right, please? Councilor Schnapp. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I couldn't agree more with that suggestion that we have a joint meeting sooner than later. Um, in, in Kelly Colopy's report, which was very well put together, uh, we're looking at spring of 2024, anticipated date for first connections. That's six months. I'm looking over here and I'm, I'm trying to interpret this um, policy and I don't know if the initial request for hookups is coming from DPW and the, the subsequent six months notification is from the Board of Health if they're not, if they haven't completed that task. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like someone's in non-compliance until a six month period has gone by. So I think the public is really going to need to know and I'm sure that there have been communications with those um, households that are going to be impacted by this in the spring. But you know, the more we bring some visibility to this issue, I think the better. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I would just you know further further explain again that this isn't a town manager area of authority, um, and I could answer you perhaps, um, but it may very well not be correct. The authority does not fall with your town manager, so um, it's best to bring in the board of health and have those direct conversations. I have another Follow question. Up. Okay. Um, I have a question uh, regarding number five uh, on your report, which has to do with the um, progress with the opioid response and the settlement money. Uh, I would like to know if there's uh, anything planned yet for late January and what will be the outreach um, that we will engage in to, to let the public know about that. Uh, I can. I believe Director Milne's here. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure if he is ready to answer that question, okay. but certainly, uh, if he is, are you comfortable with that one, Mark? Thank you, sir. Okay. Good evening, Councillors. Mark Milne, Director of Finance. Um, the we created a design team, which is working with the consultant that we've hired. I think they met. Um, last week and I think they were targeting the 30th of January for the first public forum and it's going to be located at the high school um, we'll have uh, some child care available I believe uh, hopefully some translators um, and some food and uh, water as well for for people who are in attendance but the um, our director of communications will be communicating when we have the final plan set out to the public probably in early January, I believe the target is for starting to communicate that. Okay. Uh, Mark, while you're up here, I actually have a question regarding the second part of that. Um, several paragraphs. Um, if you could translate what it means when Governor Healy signed Chapter 77 of the Acts of 2023 um, that allows these funds to go into a special fund. Uh, and it sort of says that there won't need to be any further appropriation. Does that kind of take the town council out of any fiscal decisions regarding how this money is spent? Yes, if, if the money is put into the special revenue fund, yes. So what the governor and um, looked at and her team was that there are certain types of revenues that come into communities that have restrictions placed on them. Um, and because of those restrictions, they, they felt that it wasn't necessary to have further legislative action taken to determine how those monies will be used. And so the, the director of accounts and the Department of Revenue is the person responsible for deciding which of those certain types of revenues qualify as such. And they've decided that the opioid funds, because of all the restrictions placed on them, are eligible to be placed into that special revenue fund and further, and then they can be expended by the chief executive officer of the community. 
And it's because of the restrictions that are placed on them. But the, I, I guess the division of how those monies are spent would be done by staff in, in consultation with the, the public? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's the purpose of the public forums that we're okay. going to have. And then following up the, the public forums, we're going to have more targeted forums for specific groups. And then this design team will come forward with a recommendation as to how these funds should be used. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Councilor Schnapp. Looking to my left. Any questions for town managers or staff? Councilor Turkelson, please. I don't, I don't necessarily have a question more. Um, maybe it's just a process question. The questions that Gordon has or maybe Paula brought up that will be answered, will that be distributed amongst all of us so that we all get the benefit of that information? Yeah, so you can ask a question to the Board of Health anytime you'd like, first and foremost. Um, and Or they can be forwarded through the town manager's office and I'll make sure you get an answer. Um, and. And just to kind of follow up, um, the workshop format, it, it, because there's an election um, as a town you know, uh, council president, it, it's not wise necessarily, because normally the fall is a great time to do workshops and, um, and joint workshops and things of that nature. But with the election coming up, first of all, um, with new councils, you know that there's turnover. It's good to put a pause on that so that you have the new council for all that. And then November, December, because we have the tax levy discussion, all this different stuff, you know, the last meeting for the holiday, probably not the best time to have a, uh, that. So get letting the council get their you know, uh, feet underneath them. Moving forward, there's a number of workshops that probably need to happen really to get those questions answered, not only for the councilors, but with the public, you know. Uh, so the Board of Health is one. Um, I would also uh, recommend moving forward with, you know, a workshop in regards to, you know, possibly the wind, uh, moving forward with a, a committee, a working group committee with counselors in regards to that um, topic. Also the CWMP moving forward. You know, we're coming on five years. We're not required to have a five year, but we've always said we're going to have a five year review and have that. Maybe some at large members. Again, part of the discussion moving forward, but not only getting the questions answered for the counselors, but also in the midst of, you know, a public meeting so that the, the public can hear what's happening as well and get educated on those things. We've had joint meetings with the, actually not this past fall, the fall before with the um, Board of Health where we had questions and moving forward in regards to that. So the first step was really get, letting them get some sort of regulations down on paper. And I think the next step is to have that workshop soon moving forward. But again, it's up to the next leadership to put that together. But we have some time before we start getting into the budget. Once we start getting into the capital improvement budget, operations budget, that's not the right time. But so sometime within the first quarter of the year would be a good time to have those. And we can, I mean, that's what we usually try to do, squeeze them. And we have roads, all kinds of different topics. So. Thank you for asking that question because they made a good introduction of how the process works moving forward. Okay. Council Starr, so, please. Um, if anybody has any questions for the Board of Health, maybe you could send them to me and I will put a document together. Yeah, you are the liaison. Yes, I am. Yes, so, uh, okay. right. yes. that would be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I'll, I'll put it together and then when I get answers, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you, Council Starr. Con yes, Council Penn. Hi, in the um, town manager report, <clears throat> item number four, the EFSB hearing. So um, there was some language in here. I, I, I'm not sure who, who actually wrote this, if it was them or us, okay? But the, in, in the second paragraph, when you talked about, I also asked, and, and then you itemized what's going on. It said here, Park City Wind is required to provide a copy of its compliance filing to the town, and the board may provide the town an opportunity to respond to that compliance filing if there are still areas of disagreement. Um, I was just wondering what the interpretation of that was. Um, when um, it says the board limited construction activity to 7 a.m., 6 p.m., it didn't say which days. Is that Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday? Um, I know that was being discussed when I think there was 15 minutes left and I, I signed off before at the very end of the meeting, so I might have missed that. Um, the board required compliance testing for um, the EMF once 100 megawatts are energized, but it doesn't say where um, 
they're going to do that. I, I, you know, is that just contained to the beachhead? Is that going to be further inland, um, et cetera? So I had those kinds of questions. Um, if we could be, be more specific so it's on the public record, I think that's a good idea. Sure. Good evening, Mark Ells, town manager. Um, I would defer to Karen Nober or her staff as they intervene or interact relevant to EFSB um, to answer especially the first question. Um, I'd have to go back and read the, 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 the decision that was made by the EFSB. They did bring your question up. I'd have to go back and look whether it was Monday through Friday or did it include Saturdays. There were also some exceptions um, that they identified for emergencies and when the operation needed to be 24 hours, but it was unclear who determines that it needs to be 24 hours. Um, so, uh, but we don't get to, you know, we, we, we don't get to um, direct that necessarily. Um, but I do believe they're, they left the door open um, for us to speak with Park City Wind to try to clarify that. Um, so that's not a good answer to your question. Um, but uh, I don't know if, Karen, you want to address the, uh, the issue of, of what that, that pr first provision required. Thank you. Good evening, Karen Ober, town attorney. I think I'm having a contest with Councillor Schnepp tonight. Um, the reason we worded it that way in terms of they may give the town an opportunity to be heard is when we, we went back and looked at the transcript, staff was saying to the chair of the board, oh, and the town should have an opportunity to be heard if their issues are not addressed. And she said, oh, yes, we should do that. But I don't believe that was actually incorporated into the actual final decision. So I think it's unclear what would actually happen, but we put that in there as that may happen because they did discuss that at the board meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I believe it's Monday through Friday. No, no weekend. Unless it's an emergency, I think. Was there, were, uh, I'm not sure if this is for you or for, for the town manager, but are they gonna communicate with the, the resident on, on the block, for example, if they do have to do 24 hours or if they do have to have emergency extensions, is there gonna be communication with the residents there or are they just gonna figure it out by the disturbance? I would have to go back to see what the actual requirements are with respect to the communications. So, that, so that's something we, we would have to negotiate if we have a chance to do that, communications. Uh, good evening, uh, Charlie McLaughlin, uh, Senior Counsel. Um, the discussion on what happens in this consultative process uh, is, a, is a valid one, and I think Karen hit it right on the, on the head. I was uh, participating via Zoom and uh, <clears throat> during that uh, hearing, and there was, I think, a, a real sense from uh, staff counsel to the EFSB and from at least a couple members on the board that uh, they wanted to offer us the chance to uh, be heard, uh, to provide comment and interaction with Park City Wind folks with respect to concerns we had in this long, long list of conditions. And uh, my takeaway from the comments, uh, if, if we need to, is uh, that uh, if we can't agree on something that is vital, that we certainly will have the opportunity to uh, uh, review the so-called compliance filing and make sure that it highlights what is uh, separating us on important issues uh, and, and uh, through that process uh, ask through the compliance filing uh, or have the, the uh, Park City Wind folks report to the EFSB that the town is asking to be heard on this particular issue. No guarantee on the outcome of it, uh, whether the, the board will uh, entertain that or not, but there are some issues that are still significant and we still have uh, some uh, discussions going on. We met yesterday for uh, 
over three hours with uh, council and uh, some of the engineering staff um, uh, to go through these issues one by one, and we intend to meet again next week via Zoom uh, and work through those issues and uh, and then have a draft compliance filing in hand right after New Year's. We'll have a chance at that point to uh, have our input into that if there are still things that we need to describe as separating us and why we think how of you ought to be adopted. Hopefully that will be a discussion first with in a productive discussion, I trust, with uh, Park City, as uh, we've certainly made the point that uh, it is in their interest in a lot of these things to get it right, just in terms of risk management, because these are issues that, if they go bad, can go bad uh, badly. And uh, secondly, uh, I think just as a matter of, of their uh, presence in the community and their commitment to be open and transparent, if if they can do it and it won't hurt them, why wouldn't they? And why are we getting pushback on it? So it was a very lively discussion yesterday, and I think that will continue as we go through. I, th I hope the message that we delivered, that it's in their best interest to work as closely as they can with us for these issues that are, are open. I can get into those in, at some point, but uh, um, if you wish. But uh, at the level that you're asking that question, that's where we stood. Um, <clears throat> There is a mechanism that was discussed by EFSB legal staff uh, that suggested that if uh, a uh, if the parties agree, and we've had this discussion with Park City with no commitment yet f from them until we actually see where our differences are, but uh, uh, Park City has uh, indicated, and we certainly would be prepared to ask, uh, that they're in a compliance filing that... Uh, uh, the mechanism that the, the legal staff talked about is a is a uh, notice of project change, which is a special animal recognized in the EFSB regulations. And if there is significant difference on a matter of true significance to public safety and, and welfare, uh, I, I think we'll have a chance to make a pitch that if we haven't agreed on it, that a notice of public, public change... Uh, uh, ought to, project change rather, uh, ought to be uh, enabled and give us a chance to be heard on it. And uh, we do have other um, options provided by statute outside of the EFSB process, but you walk into that with a judge saying, well, you've had your say in front of the EFSB, why, why are we here? So uh, it's unclear um, uh, whether we would have a, a, a successful challenge except through the EFSB process because we didn't file in that, and I'll talk to that uh, in a few moments, because we uh, were not filed as an intervener uh, and our petition to intervene on issues that arose after the close of the record and which we wanted to get in as an intervener still were not uh, allowed uh, to, we, to uh, uh, we were not approved as an intervener. So technically we, we do not as a town have appellate rights um, with regard to the final decision. But I, the clear message I got from some of the members who were quite outspoken on the FSB board is that they wanted to throw that bone to us and make sure that there was some opportunity there to get it uh, without necessarily granting us an unfettered right to appeal and delay this thing. So um, long answer for a couple of pointed and short questions. So thank you. So, um, Attorney Nober. Sorry, thank you. Um, the notice of project change that Attorney McLaughlin is referring to can only be filed by Park City Wind um, because they're a party. So I just wanted to clarify that that is something we can certainly discuss with them, but that's ultimately their decision. Thank you. Before I go to Council to start, thank you, Attorney Nober. I just want to ask uh, Council of Penn, do you have any follow up? Okay, good. Councilor Starr, please. Uh, thank you, President LeVay. So my, my question was, so, so in the meetings with, uh, with um, Park City Wind, you're just basically dealing with the five bullets here that are um, the board about EMF testing, um, construction coordination, um, fluid containing equipment being, that, that list is, what, is what's on the table? There is that list, and you're absolutely correct, and I think we've shared that memo uh, with, with the uh, council. Uh, so those are our prime focus. 
There, uh, we did have the benefit, uh, TPW had provided an excellent multi-page memo to us with on-the-ground issues that they're dealing with in the Vineyard Wind case, and we asked that, uh, and spent a fair amount of time yesterday talking about those. The outcome of that is that uh, the Park City Wind staff and DPW staff were attempting to meet early next week or even uh, uh, even today, it's not clear. Uh, it looks as uh, I, I don't know that they, in fact, are going to have the the right people assembled to have that meeting next week. Although that was the goal, for them to work out at the staff level, engineer to engineer, and not lawyer to engineer, uh, what the, how how best to approach those questions, um, and certainly that will take place on presumably January second if it doesn't take place before then. So that still gives us time to. Uh, draft, and we're all intent on, on uh, completing that process to the best of our ability and getting that compliance filing in shape with our input such that Park City can submit it uh, by the deadline of January 5. So, okay, thank you. Good. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Terry McLaughlin. Appreciate it. I'm getting there. Thank you. Look at my left, uh, Councilor Turkelson, please. Does Jackie Johnson's um, appealing the EFSB hearing give us any leverage? I know we're not directly involved, but if we say to Park City Wind, well, she's appealing that, would you give us some more time to be working on these items as, you know, as a kindness? Not that they need to be kind to us. But. <laughs> uh, I will mention now, uh, just as a background piece to who's kind and who isn't, the legislature uh, enacted uh, uh, section 69 of chapter 164 to create the energy facility siting board and its legislative purpose was to as one eminent lawyer who knew and knows the uh, the purpose of it was to hammer and make very difficult the prospect of municipalities successfully challenging a project uh, the the I understand the policy uh, that uh, if you get a whole bunch of NIMBY communities or perceived as NIMBY communities, that would be nothing but delay uh, and projects that are much needed for electrical uh, stability in the region, particularly after someone mentioned earlier the, the great 1965 blackout that resulted in the uh, creation of the uh, by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission of so-called ISOs around the country, independent services organizations made up of all the NSTARs, Eversources, Western Mass Electric, et cetera, of the world. And uh, the, they all gathered together eventually during one of the energy restructuring uh, bills to create this super, uh, super powerful uh, uh, agency called the Energy Facility Siting Board, and I'm going to share with you two things by memo next week, along with the hard documents, and I really commend it to your reading. And one is the Cape Wind decision that will spell out, uh, will give you a good summary of it and, and point to the highlights of how it affects what's going on, but uh, as uh, whether you're seasoned and that none of us are seasoned in it. This is not an area that crosses our path on a regular basis. And, and But uh, that said, uh, uh, particularly for anybody who uh, is going to be concerned about these discussions perhaps in early January, this would be helpful to you to read it, read our summary of it, and understand that the bottom line is with that legislative purpose out there to eliminate opposition as effectively as possible, I quip uh, during the Cape Wind matter that any semblance of or perception that uh, a due process has been provided to us is purely accidental. It wasn't intentional. So at the end of the day, <laughs> believe me, uh, we had some of the best lawyers in the, in the state on that case and uh, everyone was just jaw dropping. If you weren't been practicing in that area and you read uh, Section 69K, which I will also share with you, with, which is called the Override Statute, uh, it is stunning. It's the most powerful piece of land control legislation in the Commonwealth. And it gives to this board, the governor appoints the executive secretary of energy and environmental affairs, 
that secretary appoints all the other members of the board. So if it's um, if it's perceived that it's a bit of a closed uh, uh, cabal, um, it's probably a little strong to put it, but sometimes when you're sitting there frustrated that your legitimate objections are being ignored, uh, which was our case in, in uh, Cape Wind, uh, you understand how powerful this board is. And uh, uh, ultimately, you need to read that to understand what we're up against throughout our negotiations and with a, a predictability that uh, barring something of an enormous environmental surprise, uh, that the projects are gonna be approved. So the best thing we can do, and certainly my advice at all times will be keep that reality in mind uh, and try and work the best deal you can uh, as you go forward. But I'm getting off topic, so let me sit down and uh, get off my soapbox and I'll answer any other questions. Thank you. Yes, I uh, just a, as a side comment here, this is all pretty educational, so very much uh, thank you for that. And uh, I mean, the FSB was created, and, and, and I'm quoting an attorney, that it was created to um, override municipalities. Um, and that is and that is what we're up against. So, And that was what we tried to do, um, again, throughout this process, is try to um, maximize uh, what the town uh, benefit could be um, if 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 it was going to happen, whether we'd like to or not. So um, that being said, but obviously we have some uh, some tools to our disposal, and we'll utilize those the best we can. So anything else? Any follow up? Okay. Anybody else um, in regards to town manager report? To my left. Any follow up to my right? I see some conversations happening, but I'm not seeing any. So that's fine. So oh, town manager has a some input. Last word, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for recognizing me, Mark Ells. Uh, last town council meeting, Councilor Crow asked me questions relevant to um, the, it be, being recognized as an intervener um, in the FSB process. I didn't get uh, my my response from legal in time for me to record it. Um, I want to make sure that uh, I certainly offered to do it in my next. I have it now. It's been shared with Councilor Crow. Um, certainly can include it in my next town manager communication and then be here so that you can all see it and then ask questions of it. Mr. Crow is very detailed in his questions um, and I want to make sure that we, we get that into my report um, so that each one is answered. Um, the alternative would be to have Attorney McLaughlin come up uh, and try to, without you all having that response, um, continue this discussion. Uh, well, sir, I leave it to you. Thank you. But that, I would Jones. offer to do that, certainly. Okay, great. Thank you. That sounds like a plan. Thank you so much. Any other last? Okay. Oh, Attorney McLaughlin. I, I just want to, there's a lot of uh, public discussion in, in one of uh, Council of Crows, um, and I meant to say good day and, and congratulations to all the new members who, who are aboard, and I wish you Godspeed on this. So we've got a lot of heavy work to do, and and I know it uh, is important to all of you, so thank you for your prospective service and past service. Um, my, my point is simple. There's a lot of public comment about whether or not, and, and Councilor Crow asked, uh, what we're doing about the Commonwealth Wind case. And I just want to try and put it out on the record now that we filed this week uh, in uh, for a petition to intervene in that case. Uh, it is technically premature, what triggers a response time and the needed filing is is a uh, notice that the Energy Facility Siting Board puts out publicly that addresses the timelines for intervention, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that notice has, although there's a draft, a couple of different drafts on in the uh, EFSB docket, they're only drafts. That notice has not been finalized. It certainly has not been sent out to uh, uh, the public and to the municipalities, including us. So, uh, but uh, to uh, make sure that we were on record and, and quell any concern that we were somehow at risk for not having filed already, it was, I wanted to say importantly that that is on record. We're premature. If there's anything in the filing that requires an amendment to our petition to intervene, we'll do it. But it's on record. Rest assured, we're ready to go. And 
it, it tracks almost verbatim what we filed in the Vineyard Wind case was where we were readily admitted as a party. So I'm very confident that we'll have a good result there and be be uh, ready to participate fully if and when Cape Wind, uh, Commonwealth Wind goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McLaughlin. Okay. I had one, one quick question. Of course. Thank you. I Merry Christmas. Want, I just wanted to ask Mr. Crow if he's satisfied at the moment with waiting, waiting till the next meeting. Is that is? I am satisfied. I think that's okay. fine. I'd Thank like you. to hear him uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank okay. you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Council Starr. Council Crow. Anybody else? You sure? Okay. Very good. So that would uh, close out the town manager communications. And at this point in time, uh, Councilor Schnepp, if you please help me uh, act on the minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to move approval of the minutes of the last regular town council meeting held on December 7th, 2023. Second. First and second, any discussion in regards to the minutes from last meeting? Okay. Not seeing any discussion. Uh, council, if you could signify approval by raising a hand and saying aye. aye. That is unanimous. Now it is time of communications from elected officials, boards, committees, staff, commission reports, correspondence, announcements. Looking to my left, anybody have any announcements? The Christmas strolls are over. So, anything else? Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque. Um, I would like to put in a plug here. Uh, the Cape Cod Beer reached out to the Barnstable Adult Community Center staff last fall mm. and asked if they could help the older adults in Barnesville by putting up a giving tree at their business for their patrons and guests to take a tag and purchase items for older adults in our community. So the staff at um, the Barnesville um, Adult Community Center collaborated with them last year and together were able to help 50 older adults in our community with personalized gifts. This year, when Cape Cod Beer reached out to see if the center would like to run the program again. They asked if we would be able to double the number of older adults reached, and they agreed. So uh, just this past week, the team was able to identify 110 older adults that would best benefit from this endeavor and reach, reached out to them individually to see what they needed. All gifts were delivered this week by volunteers and received wonderful feedback. Cape Cod Beer came up with this thoughtful idea as a meaningful way to connect with older adults in our community. And um, I would like to, on their behalf, thank Cape Cod Beer for this wonderful idea and for uh, reaching out. Uh, regarding Meals on Wheels, I also asked, and they are still looking for volunteers, especially in the winter when many of the volunteers um, move to warm, warmer climates. So if anyone's interested, they can uh, contact Carol Cope at 508-790-2746, or also contact the adult, Barnesville Adult Community Center, and they can connect them with um, Carol. So these adults, I mean, these volunteers do the work every day, Monday through Friday, and serve our elder community in, um, in a very meaningful way, uh, not only delivering meals, but also doing um, inadvertent uh, wellness checks on um, people who tend to be living by themselves. So thank you for Cape Cod Beer and for the volunteers who help our seniors. Thank you, Council Clark. Any other announcements? Okay, not seeing any announcements. We'll close that part, number, uh, number eight on our agenda. And before we get into the orders of the day, why don't we take a five-minute break, and we'll come right back. Thank you.
Councils, if we can make our way back to the dais. Town Clerk and Quirk. Again, councillors, come back to the dais, please, at your earliest convenience, so we can get started with the meeting. Thank you. Okay, welcome back to the Town Council meeting here on December 21st, uh, 2023. At, th at this time, um, I need to recuse myself um, from item 2024-075, and I will be leaving the dais. Thank you. Thank you, President Levesque. Now that President Levesque has, has recused himself, and we do not currently have a vice president, the town council rules state that Councilor Starr did it last week, so it passes to the next councillor, which would be Precinct 2. I've spoken with Councillor Turkelson, and she's not comfortable with that, so I'm going to go to Councillor for Precinct 3. Uh, Councilor Ludke, could you take over for this item? Uh, yes, Anne, I can do that. Thank you. Okay, this is our first... Uh, part of old business and it's item 2024-075 and um, Councillor uh, Clark can you read this in please? Certainly this is old business requiring a public hearing with a roll call majority full council. Item number 2024-075 appropriation order in the amount of $905,000 in community preservation funds for the purpose of acquiring a conservation restriction on 5.5 acres of open space at 150 Wheeler Road, Marston's Mills, Barnstable, 
an authorization to expend a fiscal year 2024 local acquisitions for natural diversity, that is land grant, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the amount of $488,700 to defray the cost of said conservation restriction. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a public hearing. Do we have someone? Second. 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 Okay, do we have someone to speak to this item? Good evening. Congratulations for your recent elections. My name is Tom Lee for the record, and I'm the vice chair from the CPC. Um, tonight is supposed to be Lindsay here, but he is on vacations. It's a long overdue vacation, so he's not here. So I'm speaking on behalf of Lindsay. Let me give you the rationale for this project. The Barnstable Land Trust BLT is seeking approval from the Town Council for community preservation undesignated funds in the amount of $905,000 for the acquisitions of a conservation restriction by the Town of Barnstable from the current property owner, Willa Tr Realty Trust, on 5.5 .5 acres of open space located at 150 Willa Road Barnstable as on the so on as a portion of the assessor's map 103, parcel 109, lot 002. Following the acquisitions of the CL by the town, the Willow Realty Trust will transfer the property title to Barnstable Land Trust, who will become the owner and manager of the property, with the town remaining of the primary holder of the CL, and the compact of Cape Cod Conservations, uh, Conservations Trust as the secondary holder. This item seeks Town Council's approval of the conservation restrictions and authorizations for the President of the Town, Town Council to sign the final CR on behalf of the Town Council to meet the requirement of the General Law, Chapter 184, Section 32. Attached to this summary is the draft of the proposed CR, which has been revealed by the Town staff, the Conservation Commissions, BLT, and the Compact and has been submitted to the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs for review and approval. It is anticipated that the EEA's review of the CL may result in minor edits to the CL, which is a standard practice, and that their approval of the CL will be completed in spring of 2024, in time for the project closing in June 2024. Accordingly, this item also seeks town council authorizations for the town manager to negotiate the terms of the final CL. Tonight, we have Janet Moomin, the executive director from BLT, to give you the detailed background in terms of the projects. Janet. Thank you, um, Tom Lee, and greetings, members of the council. I'm Janet Milkman. I'm the executive director of the Barnstable Land Trust, and I'll, I'll give you a brief um, description of this project. We're really thrilled to be here tonight to bring this to you. It's been many years in the, in the works, and um, we're very grateful to the Wheeler family for being very conservation-minded and to members of the town attorney's office and the planning department for working closely with us and, of course, Lindsay Council and, and uh, members of the Community Preservation Committee. So this is a nine and a half acre conservation project um, which sits at the top of Middle Pond in Marston's Mills. And if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the town, we, we have subdivided it into three um, parcels. The parcel that the town is working with us on is the one furthest to the east, lots three and four. Um, it's been subdivided in order to take advantage of a couple of state grants um, that uh, we've actually been awarded and the town has been awarded, which is very exciting. So this is, um, if you go to the next slide, the last undeveloped parcel on Wheeler Road with about 600 feet of um, pond front on Middle Pond. It is mostly woodland with a small house on it that's going to be used um, for BLT staff um, who will be caretakers of the property. Hopefully we'll be able to see the beautiful photos of it. Um, 
the entire project is mapped by the state as critical um, natural habitat for rare species. The middle pond itself is uh, a habitat for rare species and is the spawning ground for the herring that come up through um, the Marston's Mills River. Here's a photo of, um, of the property and you can see the woodlands um, and a little bit of middle pond and if you go to the next slide um, you can see where it sits on middle pond and if you keep going um, this is the yellow area is mapped as a, a rare species habitat and if you continue on you can see that the whole project and this is why it was such a competitive project for the state grant process uh, is has very very high conservation value um, and if you go to the next slide you'll see it's located adjacent to the fuller farm property which is a 22 acre property owned by Barnstable Land Trust, that's the land sort of all the way, going all the way south of the red, the red area is the uh, project we're talking about. Um, the green outline is Fuller Farm. Um, and uh, the yellow outlined area just north of the property is the Danforth property owned by the town and connected um, over race lane to the airfield. So it's a really long contigu contiguous area that will be now connected by this parcel, really, really long uh, continuous um, conservation area. There will be a public access walking trail available through Fuller Farm, so parking at Fuller Farm and going around um, the fields into the woods there and then looping back to Fuller Farm. The total project cost is just under two million dollars um, and uh, 905,000 of that would come from the CPA funding and the rest provided by Barnstable Land Trust through public and private grants. And the town has been awarded 488,000 plus um, uh, grant th through the state land um, grant to reimburse over half the cost of the CPA funding. So um, it's an amazing example of how a $400,000 investment from CPA can leverage about a million and a half dollars um, to protect this really, really terrific um, conservation parcel. And um, I forgot what I was going to wrap this up with, but it's a great project I, and uh, really hope you can support it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, this is a public hearing. Do we have anybody who wants to speak to this who's in the room? And anybody online? There's no one online for this Okay, item. thank you. Anybody to my right? No? And to my left? Chris? Thank you very much, Councillor Lutke. I would just congratulate the Barnesville Land Trust for the uh, leveraging uh, these, this grant money. Uh, so it looks for like for our investment, we're getting a, a big bang for the buck and uh, connecting it with other uh, wildlife corridors or other other protected land enables the wildlife corridor that um, the Open Space Committee has been looking to um, celebrate and encourage all along. So thank you for doing the work and um, good luck with um, doing more. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Schnepp. Thank you, Councillor Lackey. Um, thank you, Janet. Um, could you speak to, a little bit to the outreach and uh, results of, of, of that with the Relay Road? Uh, neighborhood? Yes, um, we um, uh, did have had a number of conversations with the Wheeler Road community um, and have uh, discussed a few things that were of interest to them, including where the trail was going to go, um, and uh, have come to a really good place, I think. So um, the 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 only parking for the trail is going to be at Fuller Farm. It won't be on Wheeler Road. Um, and so the only access for the trail will be through um, Fuller Farm. It makes it a really lovely long trail. Um, and uh, 
And I think all of their concerns, uh, potential concerns, have been addressed. And what about the, um, you, you are going to use interns that are going to be able to stay at the house that is remaining? Yes, we um, are really thrilled to be able to have um, housing that we can offer to our own staff um, and or interns um, who will not only be caretakers of the property, but have um, the ability actually to live at a reasonable rate um, in housing on Cape Cod. So we're going to we're going to rent it at below market rates and um, and use it to as sort of an asset for our organization to be able to keep keep our own staff on on Cape. So, sounds like a win win. Okay, before I see if there's anybody else, I failed to close the public hearing, so I'm going to close that now. And then anybody else uh, wish to speak? Councillor Penn? No? No? No, I was going to echo what, uh, what uh, Councillor Schnepp had said about the housing. I think that's amazing. And will it be, how many people can live in this house? It could be three to four. Um, I'd say there'll probably likely be at least two. Okay, that's terrific. Yeah. Okay, if there's no other comments, I think we can take this to a vote. And this is a roll call majority, so uh, you can go ahead and call the roll. Thing. <coughs> Councilors Bloom. Yes. Burdick. Yes. Clark. Yes. Pro. Yes. Levesque. Oops, sorry. Ludke. Yes. Mendes. Yes. Neary. Yes. Penn. Yes. Schnapp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Tamish. Yes. Turkelson. Yes. That passes 12 yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Council Lucky. Mr. Lee, are you also doing the other CPC item? Yes. Why don't we do that now? Okay. Council Neary, please, if you could, um, item number 2024-083. And number, uh, page number 35. Okay. My pleasure, Mr. President. This is all business requiring, requiring a public hearing. It's a roll call majority, full council vote. It's item number 2024-083. It's an appropriation order in the amount of $100,000 in community preservation open space recreation funds for the purpose of providing funding to the Center of Osville Marston's Mills or Calm Water Department for professional services to evaluate the suitability of acquiring lands or interest in land adjacent to or within a zone to as defined by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection drinking water regulations and adjacent to existing calm water department drinking water supplies, as written. Second. We have a first and a second, and uh, we have uh, Mr. Tom Lee here for the rationale, please. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for filling in. Appreciate it. For the record, my name is Tom Lee again, and uh, for, i give you the rationale for this project. At the October 16, 2023 Community Preservation Committee meetings, the seven committee members pres present voted unanimously to support and recommend the Sand the Sandville, Austerville, Marston's Mill, we call the COMM Water Department, revise the CPC applications for appropriations. The COMM Water Department is seeking approval from the town council through the town manager for community preservation open space slash recreational funds in the amount of $100,000 to enable COM and water departments to research and when quickly respond to potential properties as they become available for the protections of the drinking water supply. This fund of $100,000 would allow for the commissioning of professional service, services to evaluate the suitability of acquiring properties adjacent to or within zones of contributions to COMM water departments existing groundwater supplies. 
the demand for drinking water continues to increase and proper, with, and proper planning is essential to increase pumping capacity to meet these future needs. The estimated timeline to perform the professional services on various property would, uh, property would vary by, but would begin in December 2023 and continue until December 2026. The COMM Water Department would seek partnerships with MassDEP and grant funding through state and federal agency to acquire necessary properties at the appropriate time. One thing I want to mention, though, is not written in the back in your document is this is only the second project that we funded for drinking water related, and this is important. So please consider this. Um, we have Craig Corker from the COM and Water D Districts to uh, give you the background information. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Crocker. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your uh, continued support. Yeah. Uh, Craig Crocker, Center for Lost of a Water Department, Superintendent. I don't know if you, I'm sure you're aware with our, our district. Um, this money we're asking for is to basically perform those legal and professional fees that we need um, to get started for any potential purchase. Um, those are the sites that we currently pump from right now. Um, there's really seven sites that we have that are considered well fields. We have uh, 20 groundwater wells that we pump from now. Um, we're looking to expand those, those well fields and protect our existing supplies and potentially find maybe um, a couple new sources to meet future needs. And I think we discussed the amount and the, uh, the timeline. We all know that making these types of purchases isn't something that happens overnight, it takes, takes a while to to, uh, to get everything accomplished, but I'm looking for your support on this and hopefully we can uh, find some more potential sites and, uh, and protect our existing sites. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for being with us, appreciate it. Uh, this is a public hearing. Is anybody in the audience like to speak on this item? Would anybody like to speak remotely, Director Pouillon? There is no one on Zoom for this item. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so with that, I will close the public hearing and bring it to uh, Council for discussion. Anybody have any questions in regards to this? Council Burke, please. Thank you. I was just curious, has this appeared at any, on a warrant at any of the com annual meetings? Was there, is there any matching funds? Is this strictly a, is this the complete cost? Uh, for this portion of the, the purchase, it's, uh, it has not, no. We're looking to uh, utilize the funds that are ratepayers and our customers and our taxpayers have already paid into. Any follow-up? Okay. Any other questions in regards to this? Okay. Looking to my right. Uh, Councilor Schnepp, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to um, remember um, what was the scope of the new water sources report that was done by the town or uh, a couple of years ago. Did it include anything in the Center for Osterville Marston's Mills or was it exclusively in sort of the West Barnstable, Barnstable area? Director Santos, maybe? The West Barnstable and Barnstable area. Okay, so it didn't include anything in the comp. Okay, thank you. Just for the record, uh, Director Santos, uh, DPW said it was just Barnstable, West Barnstable area. Okay, to thank answer you. your question. And then this is just a real technical CPA question. Um, a project like this that has a three-year time frame, um, is it a reimbursement by expense, in, or, or does, do, is it a, just a lump sum given to come if we approve it? Okay. It's a reimbursement fund. Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you for your service to our town. Um, a question uh, for Mr. Crocker. Uh, when, you, when you will be looking for new sources of water, will that be within the boundaries of the COMM area? Uh, more than likely, yeah. We do own um, some land out 
towards the uh, West Barnstable, Marston's Mills, Crooked Cartway area. So we'll be looking, you know, out, out in that way as well. Any any place that we have existing uh, supplies, we'll be looking to possibly uh, protect those further. And the second question, I, uh, more a statement. Uh, I congratulate you for being forward thinking about looking for new or, or protecting the water sources that we have before we run out of property to protect. And um, I should say, after having served on the town's Open Space and Recreation Committee, then it was the Land Acquisition and Preservation Committee, it's again the Open Space Committee, um, that um, inevitably every time there's an evaluation for criteria for purchasing land, the number one uh, rationale is to protect municipal water sources. So this is, this is something I could put, put all my support towards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clark. Any other questions? Council Starr, please. I had a quick question. Um, have we seen this before? Or did I see this at a CPC meeting? Yes, you did. Second part, you saw it at a CPC. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yep, now it's before us. Any other questions? It went through the CPC twice. That's oh, basically, yeah, yep. It says a revised. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So. Any other questions in regards to that nope. item? Sounds good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so not hearing any, uh, this is a roll call majority full council vote. Town Clerk Ann Quirk, please. Councilors Burdick? Yes. Clark? Yes. Crow? Yes. L Levesque? Yes. Ludkey? Yes. Mendes? Yes. Neary? Yes. Penn? Yes. Schnepp? Yes. Starr? Yes. Tamish? Yes. Turkelson? Yes. Bloom? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your service. Thank you. I'd just like to thank uh, Lindsay and his group, too. Yes, CPC absolutely. As well. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that. Take care. Enjoy your holiday. Council Mendes, please, if you could, item number 24-077. 20, this is old business, item number 2024-077. This is for a public hearing, roll call two-thirds full council. Appropriation and loan order in the amount of $770,000 for the purpose of funding the Bursa's Way Vacuum Service Replacement Project. Second. The first and second, and we have Director of the Department of Public Works, Dan Santos, here for the rationale. Thanks. Good Welcome. Councilors, Dan Santos, Director of Public Works. This project includes replacement of the vacuum sewer system on Barris's Way from Route 132 to Enterprise Drive with a new gravity type system. This project is scheduled to be implemented as part of the Mass DOT project for the Barris's Way shared use path. Bids were opened by Mass DOT for the project and the sewer component of the project was over the existing appropriated budget of $1,125,000 under Town Council Order 2019-133. The project provides the town with an opportunity to work in conjunction with the MassDOT project to replace an extremely vulnerable component of the town's sewer collection system. Currently, the town utilizes a vacuum sewer system to convey wastewater flows from Bierce's Way in a portion of Route 28 to the water pollution control facility. The vacuum sewer system is a vulnerable system approaching the end of its useful life. The system accounts for nearly 40% of the Water Pollution Control Facility Emergency Response Call, despite only carrying 5% of its flows. The project, will the project will replace approximately half of the vacuum sewer system. The revised total appropriated cost for the project is $1,895,000. It will be financed with a loan through the State Revolving Loan Program. It is listed on the 2023 Clean Water State Revolving Fund Intended Use Plan and is eligible for a low interest loan and principal subsidy from the trust, as well as from the Cape Cod and Islands Water Protection Fund. Completion of the project is anticipated to reduce callouts and maintenance. Future sewer enterprise fund operating budgets will include the principal and interest payments on the loan payback, which is estimated to be approximately $90,000 per year for 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos, and this is a public hearing. Is anybody in the audience like to speak on this item? Is anybody like to participate remotely? Director Poyant. 
There is no one on Zoom for this item. Okay, and not seeing any anyone wanting to speak on this item in the in the hearing room, I would close the public hearing and move to council discussion. Looking to my left, any questions for Director Santos? Councilor Penn, please. Um, good evening. I noticed the uh, the last sentence under financial impact you uh, chose not to read, which was sewer utility rates may be need to be adjusted to ensure adequate revenue is generated to provide funding for this new loan. Um, do you have an estimate? Is that system-wide customers of the sewer? Is that just in a certain area? No, we will, um, as we're doing our annual rate study right now, and we will include uh, these costs as part of that rate study, and our rates will be adjusted throughout the system according to all the debt service for all of our projects. and. Uh, our costs. Okay, so this is just added in, and it'll yes. be part of the general increase that basically happens annually. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Looking to my left, Council Kirkelson, please. Do you have a question? Um, under the low interest loan rate, do you know what the rate of that is? Uh, currently, Mark, do you? 1.5. 1.5%. 1.5? Yes. And what's the age of the um, sewer vacuum that you're replacing? It's about 20 years old now. And this new vacuum is anticipated to last how long? Uh, well, it'll be a new gravity system, so it's non-vacuum, more traditional, and they last. We have 100-year-old we have pipes in the ground that are still operational. This vacuum system, uh, 20, 25 years ago, like many technologies, they, they come and go. It was thought to be... Uh, a, a good new technology, cost-effective, low maintenance, fewer parts, and it hasn't turned out that way. Uh, nationally, they've been problematic, and you may recall reading about Provincetown's trouble uh, a few years ago. They had a complete failure of their vacuum system and shut down their sewer system for days. Uh, we actually bailed them out by providing some parts for our system that they provided back, but that was able to get them uh, over the hump. So we really, we really want to replace this system before we have any kind of um, failure of that nature. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Tamish, please. In the uh, rationale, it says this project will replace approximately half of the vacuum sewer system. If it's problematic, uh, is, is it a cost issue that you're not replacing the whole thing? or? What? What's the rationale well, for replacing half? Well, because of the shared use path, we're taking a, uh, advantage of the opportunity to have um, this project done and save money uh, while the state is working off the road and creating this new shared use path, we'll be putting this, the new sewer in. So we're taking advantage of that. We're going to be programming uh, the other half of the system over the next couple of years to uh, replace uh, through our normal channel of capital improvement program. Okay, so the new section will replace the vacuum that's there, then it'll hook into the old vacuum and wherever? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Councilor Tamish. Councilor Lucky, please. Yeah, a couple of questions uh, piggybacking on that. If we can use a, a gravity, even though it had all the bells and whistles, why would you have put a, a, a vacuum system in where, where a gravity system would have been appropriate? I really can't answer that. I think there was a questions at the time uh, when they put this in, and it was just that was the choice they went with based on the uh, consulting engineers they used, the public works director at the time, and uh, the costs. So that, that was the choice at the time. It was a new, new technology, I think, that uh, people wanted to try out, and uh, it was highly touted, but it just hasn't worked out that way. Okay. And, and then the second one is... Who prepared the cost estimate? It seems like the bids were over by quite a bit. Uh, we had a consulting engineer prepare the cost estimate. It was done in 2019 uh, before uh, COVID-19. And that period of COVID-19 has seen dramatic uh, increases in construction costs throughout the country. Is and that this, normal? Uh, did we have a, a cost estimate that old that would... Go into this, a process? Uh, the project uh, was supposed to be bid uh, prior to recently, and uh, so it, it is a little older than normally would be the case, but it's the one we had. Okay. It's a state project. <coughs> so 
So it wasn't bid by the town. Councilor Schnitt, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, is the current um, principal subsidy 25% of the cost of the project from the CAPE and the trust fund? I'm going to turn to Mark Mill. I think it was for 2023, which this project is. It is 25%, yes. Okay. So the $90,000 loan payback includes the fact that they've got that principal pay down and, and the 1.5. Okay, thank you. Good question. Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you very much for your presentation. Piggybacking on Councillor Lutke's um, question, uh, I, my understanding is when many of the projects you present to us um, have the financial uh, layout, there are contingencies built in. So apparently this contingency or the, the expense out, outpaced the contingency that was built in? Yes, very much so. And um, are there any reserves from past projects that you could um, patch together to lessen that um, the amount that you have to borrow? No. Thank you, Council Clark. Any other questions for Director Santos in regards to this item? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, this is also a roll call, two thirds majority vote. Town Clerk and Work, please, for the roll call majority vote. Councilors Clark. Yes. Crow. Yes. Levesque. Yes. Ludke. Yes. Mendes. Yes. Neary. Yes. Penn. Yes. Schnepp. Yes. Starr. Yes. Tamish. Yes. Turkelson. Yes. Bloom. Yes. Burdick. Yes. Passes 13. Thank you. Unanimous. Um, moving on to the next item, 2024-082. Uh, Council Lucky, please, if you could, read it as a record. Okay, thank you. This is old business. It may be acted upon by a majority vote. 2024-082, an order authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the town of Barnstable and Barnstable County for dredging services. Second. First and second, and Director Santos here for the rationale, please. Thank you. The Katuit Bay entrance and embayment channels require dredging to maintain safe navigation. Utilizing the Barnstable County's dredge program is more cost effective than retaining a private contractor. So uh, we utilize this method uh, whenever we can. The county dredge uh, has scheduled the project to, complete, to be completed this coming winter, um, probably later in the winter, uh, February time frame at this point. The cost of the Barnstable County dredge service will not exceed $345,700. The town has received a $300,000 Massachusetts dredging grant for this project. The remainder will be funded by an existing capital appropriation, which is uh, number 2021-102. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos, the rationale. Council of discussion in regards to this item. Looking to my left. Anybody have any questions, Director Santos? Looking to my right. Council Lucky, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say what you, what you say is entirely accurate. We had a, a great presentation from the county on this dredge program at a recent breakfast of the Cape and Islands municipal leaders, and the savings are enormous. And it also benefits, it, it's a good, it's a win-win for everybody to use this uh, program. So that's fantastic that uh, you've put this together. Thank you. Thank you. Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you again for the presentation. Um, just, um, just for our edification, shall I assume that the permits are already in order for, if you're going to be doing that this winter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clark. Councilor Schnepp, please. Question? Question. Okay, very good. Excellent. Any other questions for Director Santos in regards to this item? Okay, not seeing any. Council, if you could please... Uh, Signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos. Thank you. Moving on to the uh, next item of new business. Um, uh, Council Starr, please, if you could, item number 2024 085. Let's see, uh, 085. Okay. This is. Um, Wait a second. I got it. I got it. Um, this is new business, may be acted upon with a majority vote. 
Um, it's item 2024-085. Acquisition of an easement for sewer purposes on land at 944 Shoot Flying Hill Road in Centerville. Second. We have first and a second. We have attorney Thomas LaRosa for the rationale. Please welcome. Is your microphone on? Is the microphone on? Is it green? Is that better, everyone? Perfect. Yeah, much better. Thank you. Just reintroduce yourself. Sorry about that. I thought I saw the green light, but um, as part of the DPW's efforts for answer, advancing the town's comprehensive wastewater management plan, they're moving forward with plans for uh, gravity sewer expansion on Shoot Flying Hill Road and the adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, necessary for, for that the installation of the gravity sewer system is a sewer substation on shoot on shoot flying hill road dpw had identified locations that would work and negotiated a location with the landowner on a portion of their property at 944 shoot flying hill road um, this easement is would be roughly 3765 square feet and um, the town the the easement has been appraised at $11,000, and that would be the amount that would be paid to the landowner. We would uh, finalize the acquisition with the landowner through a negotiated friendly taking of an easement. The $11,000 is, uh, that would be paid under a separate existing appropriation, so it's not part of that, that here tonight. So, um, so we'd be asking just for the council's approval for acquisition of the easement, which we would plan to, if approved, finalize within the month, next month or so. Thank you very much for the rationale. Any questions, Attorney LaRosa? Council Turkelson, please. I'm just curious how it is that this land has already been cleared before everything has been done. The area of land that has been cleared? Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that the, the landowner, uh, that she had planned to do, remove some... Um, trees on her property it's she had let the DPW know that she would be doing that prior to finalizing the transaction so the land clearing was of her own doing not of the town's doing correct okay thank you thank you council Turkison any other questions regards to this item no. okay no. hey not seeing any uh, council if you could please uh, raise your hand signify approval by saying aye. Aye. aye I believe that is unanimous thank you very much thank you councilors Um, next item of uh, new business, um, Council Tamish, please, if you could. Um, item number 2024-086. Uh, new business, first reading, to be referred to a second reading on 1-4-2024. Uh, item number 2024-086, order authorizing the award and execution of a five-year contract with Exxon Enterprise, Inc. for the purchase of body-worn cameras and the associated licensing and storage of all data to establish a body-worn camera program for the Barnstable Police Department. Second. We have a first and a second. We're just referring this to, again, for a second reading on January 4th, 2024. Uh, Council, if you could please uh, signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. aye. That is unanimous, so moved. And... Um, Councilor Burdick, if you put please, item number 2024-087. Thank you. Uh, this is new business to refer to a public hearing on January the 4th, 2024, item 2024-087. Appropriation order in the amount of $73,654 for the Barnesville Police Department fiscal year 2024 operating budget for the purpose of funding the initial operating expenses for the hiring of nine patrol officers. Second. The first and the second, thank you for that. And uh, so referring to a public hearing on January 4th, 2024. And uh, Council, if you could please signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. aye. That is unanimous. Okay. That is the last, last item of new business. And now it is time for me to hand over the meeting to, over to Town Clerk Ann Quirk uh, for the Town Council election of uh, 2024 officers. Thank you, President Levesque. I'm opening the election for the Barnesville Town Council year 
2024, the leadership of President and Vice President. And in this process, the way it works is that we allow the um, candidates to speak if they wish to, and then um, those of you who want to speak to each or or not speak, up to you, uh, to the, for the candidates, then you have a chance to do that as well. We'll vote on the president first, and then we'll vote on the vice presidency. So I'm opening it first, and if I see the hands, that's what I have to do. Um, who, if, do either of the candidates wish to speak on their behalf? Councillor Penn, please. <clears throat> Thank you in f for believing in me and the nomination for president. I do not take your support for granted, and I plan to earn it every day. I believe I'm qualified to be president and in these five minutes. I will share why. My leadership, organizational management skills, and overall experience qualify me for this position. In my professional life and thereafter, I served as a member of, chair of, or president of numerous committees and boards. I was the first female president of the Rotary Club of Hyannis. I served as a member and president of the board of the Hyannis Chamber of Commerce. Our board first brought the Boston Pops to the Hyannis Village Green. I served as president of the United Way of Cape Cod on the board of Cape Cod Bank and Trust, Mid Cape Home Centers, and the Housing Assistance Corporation. I spent 20 years on the foundation of Mass Maritime Academy and five additional years on its board of trustees. While a member of the board, I chaired the search committee for the new academy president and went to DC to lobby both the House and the Senate and met with the Office of Management and Budget to fund the design and building of six new multi-purpose training ships for all US maritime academies. It's been a long road, but the academy ship will be delivered this spring and I really can't wait to see it dockside. I spent over 20 years on the Cape Cod Economic Development Council on behalf of the county and chaired the grants committee for the Cape and Islands license plate. The art of shanties, the alleyway on the west end of Main Street, and other improvements are products of license plate grant funds. I spent nine years on the planning board and was chair for two. I served on the board when the growth incentive zone was new and helped create the current local comprehensive plan. I have worked since I was 11 years old. While working for my family business, I also ran the Hyannis Street Festival for many years. This predated the bid and open streets. I left my family business 24 years ago. And I am openly disclosing to you now that I have no current financial interest in it or the building at 400 Main Street. I have no conflicts, and I do not personally benefit from anything to do with Main Street or any other place in town. My goals for this council are simple. I will work to assure that we all respect each other and work as a team. I will also work to assure that the council adheres to the town charter, as well as our town council rules. If we don't operate according to either, then either we will change how we operate or we'll change the rules so we adhere to them. The town council must insist on openness in doing the work of the public. We are elected to represent our constituents' interests, and one of the first steps is to assure the public is aware of what's happening at all times, what committees exist, who populates them, what their agendas are, that no one has a conflict, and that minutes are taken and posted is all critical. Speaking of who's on what committee, it's imperative that qualified people without self-interest and professional connections populate our committees. I can guarantee you, if you support me, the committees will not be populated with my friends or business associates. I plan to open the proce process for setting agendas so that all counselors are welcome, as well as staff, town management, the press, and any members of the public who choose to attend. I would like to recreate town notes in the Patriot, and we'll hold conversations with the publisher about this possibility. I aim to establish council subcommittees on water resources and wind, and other subjects as they come up. 
I anticipate bringing the housing issue front and center. We can't build our way out of this problem. We need to examine the options for incentivizing year-round rentals and limiting vacation rentals. We may have the units we need, it's just that they're not being used to house our year-round population. As a friend of mine recently said, motels are being used for houses and houses are being used for motels. That's pretty crazy, don't you think? I will also work to assure that the town's plans are used to shape policy and that their goals and recommendations are implemented. There's nothing worse than a plan sitting on the shelf, not to mention the effect it has on the volunteers who work to bring it to life, only to witness its fall into obscurity. If you elect me town council president, I will work to change our philosophy from being reactive to being proactive. As I learned in scouting, I will leave the council in better condition than I found it. I ask for your vote, and I thank you for your support. Thank you, Councilor Penn. Councilor Snap. I want to extend another welcome to all the new councilors and to all the returning councilors. I know this is our second meeting together as a new council. It's very exciting, and we're going to be heading into 2024 with a very large agenda. It's a real honor to be elected to represent over 3,700 people in my precinct. And, our, and the same can be said for all of us. We represent a lot of folks, 13 representatives, closing in on 50,000 people in the town of Bernstable. We not only represent our constituents, but our decisions that we make here up on the dais affect the welfare of the entire community. That means our residents, our non-residents, and our seasonal visitors. And I think it's important that uh, I and my fellow colleagues take that into consideration when we are making our very important uh, votes. I've lived in Merson's Mills for 20, over 27 years. I grew up in the Midwest, so I'm not, I'm a wash ashore, but I have thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to live here, uh, surrounded by bogs, being able to swim in our lakes and ponds. And for many of you uh, who I've served with already, you know that I'm a, a big outdoor fanatic. I row early in the morning, and I've gotten to know so many wonderful parts of our town, whether it's the Meeting House Farm in the Labyrinth in West Barnstable, Sandy Neck, which covers Barnstable and West Barnstable, Katuit Bay, Lake Waquaket. I've really enjoyed exploring the Centerville River, kayaking up, up and down that, fishing and picnicking at Dowsett's Beach, and enjoying many outdoor concerts at Azelton Park. I feel like I really understand and know how important it is to protect the incredible assets we have in this town of Bernstable and that the decisions we make and the priorities that we establish are critical. It's what motivates me to serve. I've served on this town council for six years. I've had uh, an opportunity for leadership as a vice president for two years. I've served on the appointments committee for two of my six years, uh, one as a chair. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve on what was then the zoning and regulatory committee we had an opportunity to initially address the issue of short-term rentals uh, and, and the impact that they have. Uh, the full council was not able to reach a consensus on that, so that issue may need to be revisited as we look at the broader issues of our housing policy, but we did give it a good go. We did return to look at uh, creating by right accessory dwelling units. And I think we came up with a very successful ordinance that did pass the council a couple years ago. So I think we have made some progress in trying to identify ways that we can deal with our housing issues here in Barnstable. Again, the things that are so vital and important are, are clean our waterways. I mean, I, I see the effects of the nitrogen in our coastal embayments. We also need to be considerate of uh, building a resilient community. 
We have a lot of impacts of climate change already affecting us. We have stormwater systems that are aging and need to be improved. We need to be thinking of our coastal lands and how we can protect those. And we need to provide housing that helps support the folks that support us, whether it's in our hospitality or retail industry, healthcare. I know Councilor Mendes had mentioned that. You know, we, we have shortages in so many different critical labor areas in our town. If we don't have housing. We're not going to have those people. And we also have issues with our municipal workers. You know, we're having a hard time staffing some of our departments, being housing being a critical issue. I want to say that I've had the great honor of working with an incredible professional staff in the town of Barnstable. I can't think of a more committed, motivated, and really smart group of people that we have here in the town of Barnstable. In addition, we also have amazing volunteers that are part of our committees. Our regulatory boards, you know, Board of Health, Planning Board, Conservation Commission, uh, Zoning Boards of Appeals, amazing people serve on these. And you know, there might be a few people that you might not agree with their perspectives, but most of the meetings that I have watched, there is a lot of effort that, to, to come to the decisions that they reach. And I'm very proud of those volunteers and the time that they've committed. We have volunteers that run our Citizens Academy. And we have volunteers that help at our Burnsville Adult Community Center with the, our monthly brown bake lunches, the holidays, uh, that, that uh, holiday luncheons and dinner. We also have an enviable financial portfolio here in the town of Barnesville. Unbelievably. I mean, I, I think we're, we're on the top of the heap for, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the AAA bond ratings we have. We have a lot to be proud of living in this town. So our work as town councilors is to craft the policies that reflect the values of our entire community and couple those policies with adequate resources to implement them. So it's important for us to realize that not everybody's showing up in the room. As I said earlier, 3,700 people just in our, our individual precincts. And we know what the voter tallies were from the last election. A small percentage come out to vote. Those are important, important people. But I'd love to see those numbers be a lot larger that really engage our public to know and understand how important local government is. And so a lot of what we need to do is to make sure that everyone knows what's going on in the town of Barcelona. And we have done many things to try to engage the public. I don't think we've really, uh, you know, failed in our attempts. It's just that sometimes people's lives are very busy. And we need, as individual counselors, sometimes to kind of take on that legwork of making sure that the people we serve, you know, some of you have excellent news, e-newsletters, and uh, one of these years I hope to have one too, but thank you for, for, for providing that information service. So if I'm elected president, there's four areas that I think are, are vitally important. And as uh, Councilor Penn, the, our communication is vital. And communication among ourselves. I think there are a lot of ways that we can enhance the communication that we've had in the past um, by having more opportunities to share you know, what happens at agenda or leadership meetings in the form of written communication. We always have to be careful of the constraints of open meeting law, that information that is shared is not, you know, doesn't, doesn't inspire conversation among a number of counselors. But I think we can be creative in finding ways that that information doesn't always feel last minute. I think the uh, possibility of opening the agenda to a more public process, I, I have a few concerns with that, um, only because we have two council meetings that are established uh, on a monthly basis. We have our calendar. It allows for all of us to be in attendance at those council meetings. Very important to have our representation there. If we start adding sort of additional meetings onto our schedule, 
I'm concerned that that it won't be equal access to all the counselors and, and the public. So I, I, I look at that suggestion with some interest, but I think I'd be concerned that depending on how it's structured, it might not, it might, uh, it might have some interesting consequences. I think delegation of our work is very important and the resumption of some of our town council committees, uh, I think is a great idea. I'd like to, uh, form some of those as task forces that have a kind of an endpoint and, and very specific deliverables. I think sometimes our committees kind of keep searching for what to do next and that in, in many cases having a task force to address very critical issues uh, would be a better format to start out with. Uh, housing would be a number one uh, area that I, I believe we should be addressing. We already talked at a previous, well, last council meeting about tax policies that might affect housing. Uh, there's a housing bond bill with a lot of different suggestions on what we might be able to do financially. And there might even be recommendations again to reopen, you know, whether it's a short term rental or other housing policy questions. So. Uh, that is one example of, of a committee that, or a task force that I think we would put in place, hit, hit the ground running. The comprehensive wastewater management plan definitely needs some larger review. And to me, that, it, that would probably be an ongoing committee that would be staffed not only with counselors, but members of our other uh, town committees and uh, possibly other members of the public. Administratively, uh, the leadership has a lot of responsibilities that are pretty much, you know, invisible to either both the rest of the council or even the, the larger public. And some of that has to do with supervising our staff. We have a town council administrator and we have responsibilities for ensuring that her, her work in this case um, is meeting you know, the, the needs of the full council. There's the setting up the meetings, working with staff. There's, there's a lot of, again, behind the, science, behind the scenes things that have to happen. And again, not to be done in secret, but to make sure that they're getting uh, handled. And then the last thing that I think is very important uh, for leadership and as president is the relationships we have with our public officials um, and, and other interested party. I mean, I think it's very important that we work with our regional, state, and federal officials because, you know, the town of Barnstable wants to be, you know, right there for grant opportunities, and we've been very successful with those. We want to be up there if we need any home rule petitions that we need passed. So I think it's very important to have those good relationships, and I feel like I bring a lot of that uh, to the table. So in conclusion, I want to say that we all come to this dais with our own personal experiences and our own passions, our desires to get something done or perhaps prevent something from happening. I respect that. And in fact, I welcome the fact that we're, we're coming from different perspectives because we're representing 50,000 people and we need to have a little bit of, of those different perspectives when we come here. So that's a good thing. And we need to have a way to communicate with each other and respect each other. So I welcome that. And the, the extent that we can find more ways to do that, whether it's through workshopping, through our smaller council committees or task forces, let's do it. But the most important thing is for us to trust each other. You know, some of us have been here for a couple more years than others, but I think we're all here for the, the good of the, the people. And so I want to help lead the council in doing the work that you all came, signed up for. So thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Councilor Schnepp. All right, I'm looking for hands. If anyone out there would like to add a speech in support of one or the other of the candidates. Any of you, Councilor? Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And we're fortunate. Um, I just kind of checking off bullet points. And uh, we're fortunate to have you both put your name in the ring here. This is great. My 
concern or my thoughts or my, I think what faces the town of Barnstable uh, is housing. I, uh, I currently experience it in my own family and I have countless people that I know in town, not only family members, but people that have worked for me over the years and continue to work for me that are uh, housing um, troubled. And that's, that's an understatement. There have been comments, you know, we, we've circled back to STRs into, into these type of conversations, but I might not be correct, but even if we moved every single person out of a short-term rental and made it a long-term, that doesn't even approach the amount of available housing that we need as a community to, to move forward, to, 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 to drive business to us, to, to create opportunities for people to grow and live here. And I know this personally. I know it personally. Um, Councilor Penn, you have an incredible background. I love the maritime part. <laughs> And I'm sure that either person who is, who's up for election here will serve us well. Um, I've worked with Paula for six years now, and uh, she's uh, pretty humble. But uh, again, in the housing aspect of things, you got a little history in housing. And over the six years, I've learned that you have far more financial understanding of what it takes to create housing and, uh, and, and what housing can accomplish and what lack of housing creates. So um, I do believe, and, and I know this has been touched upon by, by members in, in the public and, and members that I've talked to about experience. Um, it's one year and uh, you, have, you have experience of, of what's gone on in uh, running a council, operating a council and being involved with it. And you also obviously, the, 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 the many items that you've been involved with in terms of committees and, and, uh, and boards and whatnot. So um, with that, I, I'm happy that, that you both are, are uh, up for election. And, uh, and uh, I wish you both all well, because you know, once the election is over here, <laughs> the real work starts for one of the two of you, and uh, frankly, better you than me. But again, thank, thank you so much for putting your name in the ring. All right, I appreciate it. Would, would anyone else on the council like to say anything? Kristen. I did um, take the time to meet with um, some of the councilors that have been here longer than myself, obviously. Um, and I appreciated their time and their effort to describe to me um, their viewpoints and really tried to take that in. And as far as I guess I'm echoing what Paul said. Um, I'm impressed to know that if Felicia is elected, she's not me who just stepped on this council and knows not nearly enough. So um, I feel confident that we do have two great candidates who will both serve us well and both have experience that may differ, but um, I, I appreciate that the right people have stepped up to do the job, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turkelson. Anyone else? It appears that there is no one else that wants to speak, so I'm going to go to the next step and tell you that the um, roll call vote is what I'm asking for. And when I, when I say your name, you tell me the name of the person that you want as president. Oh, is everybody clear? On that? Okay. So I'm going to start now. And because we rotate this, the first person that I'm going to speak to is uh, Councillor Crow. Penn. Levesque. Councillor Schnapp, please. Ludke. Penn. Mendes. Schnapp. Neary. Schnapp. Penn. Penn. Schnapp. Schnapp. <laughs> Star. Schnapp. Tamish. Penn. Turkelson. Penn. Bloom. Penn. 
Burdick. Schnepp. Clark. Penn. One second. I'm going to count these up. Congratulations, Councillor Penn. You are now our president. Thank you all. All right, moving right along. It is now time for us to hear from um, either of the candidates for vice president. If you'd like to say something, I need to see a hand and we'll go from there. Gordon, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Either way, you know, okay. Thank you. Um, my, my name is Gordon Starr. Um, you all know that. Um, I'd like to also welcome the new counselors. Um, appreciate everybody who took the time to run and the energy it took. Um, I know it was, I didn't have such, it was long, another story there. Um, so, um, I, and I also, I wanted to, a lot of things that um, Paula Schnepp said, I will repeat probably. Um, we have, we have an amazing staff, legal staff, financial staff, planning staff, who's not here at the moment. Um, great, hardworking, professional people. Um, you can rely on them. Um, and we, we do every day. So it's, it's, um, it's a sort of a pleasure to work with. I don't know if anybody here um, has heard about Wellfleet recently. If you, I, get, I get the promise down independent because I like local newspapers. Um, so read about Wellfleet. Um, so I, I really wanted to talk about two different two different ideas. Um, one is process, and the other is just some of the issues that we're going to have to deal with in the next. There are a lot of issues. Um, and like, like um, Rob Brennan said and somebody else said, we've got a lot of hard work to do. Um, so in terms of process, um, you know, there's, there's always room for improvement communication-wise. We've talked about that. Um, I'd like to see more communication between town councilors, you know, leadership and town council. I don't know how to, you know, I'm not sure the best way to do that. Um, without quorum issues and without, but you know, like I was talking with Kristen earlier about Board of Health, how do, I, how do I say that to you without crossing lines? Like, I can't put my opinions in what I share with you, but I can give you the facts, so I should be doing that, okay. Um, I also have um, talked to people about the agenda meeting, not necessarily being open to the public, but at least maybe being a quick meeting where it's sometimes I've felt frustrated not being able to get things on the agenda. Um, so maybe, you know, and maybe even just small things like let's, um, you know, let's, let's, let's take 10 minutes and talk about the water quality advisory committee and just the possibility of setting that up as an ad hoc committee. Um, just let's talk about it. Um, you know, what should it look like? How long should the committee meet for? Just, and just get, maybe say, you know, we're going to put two people to go off and work on it and come back. Um, something like that. Um, um, Paula talked about, um, uh, task force or ad, ad hoc committees. I think we had one recently on the zoning and reg committee that looked at short-term rentals. It wasn't, there was a little bit of uh, um, angst there, but um, it seems to have worked out at the moment, but maybe we, maybe we do need to revisit that as an ad hoc committee. Um, but there's a long list of them, um, you know, and, and again, you know, having a, a set time and a charge and say, come back in three months. And, um, but there's, you know, we talked recently about a roads committee, public-private roads. We talked about um, water quality advisory committee. Um, maybe we could look at green communities again. Um, uh, we, we talked about civil service at one point, um, flow-neutral land controls, which I'll explain someday. Um, tool, tools, you know, housing. We've all talked about transfer tax, you know, 40Y, um, and then so, and the other, the other thing I think we need to um, just to inform the new councillors is we, we have a strategic plan. And the town manager will, will always will come up and say, will basically say, that's, what, that's my go-to. I will go to the strategic plan if I'm not sure what to do. Um, and I think we, we sort of stumbled on it this fall, knowing that there, were gonna, there was going to be a large changeover in the town council. So we didn't, we didn't put a lot of time and energy into it the way I would, hoped we could have had more discussions and more time. So, um, so I think that's something down the road to look at, to redo, just because that's it's important. And and I th and I, I'm, I I sort of miss the discussions to get to the consensus that a strategic plan would have. So I throw that out there. Um, issues to work on. So that was process issues. Um, we need to work on some kind of 
climate action plan. The state has a climate action plan. The Barnesville County has a climate action plan. There are goals set through the um, Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, we, need, we need to do our part, and we need to, to do it soon. Um, Green Communities is a pro state program that um, would help with us, help us to um, adopt more, more stringent building codes. So we're building buildings now that are gonna be, people are gonna be living in for, what, 100 years? I mean, look at some of the houses around here. So we want them built as tight as can be now. Um, but that, so we have, that's maybe something to look into. Um, housing, we need a housing production plan. I know the planning department maybe has been, they've been, they've been, they've been working hard. <laughs> they've got a lot of things on their plate. But we also don't have a housing coordinator. Maybe that has to do with, how, you know, Maybe that has to do with housing. I don't know, <laughs> something there. Um, inclusionary zoning is another thing to look at. At the moment, we, we require 10%. Some of the, like the new Hanover buildings behind BJ's has 13% affordable in it. But we're, we're never gonna get to 10% as a town if we keep doing 10%, 13%. Um, I, I asked for 17%, remember, at Hanover, and I got voted down. Um, Water resources, I think, are important. I think we need to start thinking about water districts and maybe some synergies of them working together. Um, I say that out loud. Um, <laughs> um, Just don't mention the fire department. I, you noticed. Um, let's see. Um, the airport. The airport's another. Quite, you know, what is the future of aviation? What's the master plan? Um, blue economy is important. Um, reduce, reducing solid waste, recycling, and food waste. You know, those are all issues that are going to come to a head. So, um, so I'm looking forward to working with everybody, um, and I think we'll have a we'll have a good year. Thank you. First of all, I hate using the word "I," but it's very difficult to talk about yourself, unfortunately, without using the word "I." Just as a way of introduction, uh, Gordon had mentioned that maybe we don't know each other very well. Uh, I've lived in town uh, since. Uh, 1960s. I've been here for almost 65 years or so. Attended Barnesville High School. Uh, attended Northeastern University. Have a bachelor's degree in law enforcement and a master's of public administration, again from Northeastern. And worked for the police department for 41 years. I'll get into that a little bit more. As far as my outside activities, I was a uh, firefighter, call, call firefighter and calm fire for 19 years. Uh, even while I was on the police department, I uh, kind of wore both hats for a while. I was on the Austinville Village Association Board of Directors for about five years. Uh, I'm currently on the Tales of Cape Cod Board of Directors and been there for about three years. And I currently volunteer with Barnesville Neighbor to Neighbor, both as a service coordinator and uh, as a driver. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I've worked for the police department for 40 years. I was deputy chief for 28 years and was intimately involved in working with all of the town departments. I think that I've worked with every single town department in one way, shape, manner, or form uh, over the years. Particularly, I worked very closely with the uh, administrative services, both with the town managers. I worked with every single town manager from uh, Warren Rutherford to Jim Tinsley, to Tom Lynch, to John Klim, and now to uh, Mark Ells. Uh, I've worked with all of the finance directors, and certainly uh, working with Mark Milne has been a pleasure over the years. Uh, I hope everybody appreciates the job that he does. Uh, I don't think uh, there's a finance director in the state or, or further farther that uh, does the job that he does. and. Uh, can uh, spout the figures and almost line uh, line uh, items and uh, uh, the numbers off the top of his head. Having said that, uh, I, as a deputy chief on the police department, I was intimately involved in formulating budgets. Worked with all of the budget directors, uh, particularly Bob O'Brien over the years, for those that remember Bob, uh, who was another gem as far as budgets go and uh, was very involved in, in both uh, formulating budgets and presenting budgets to the town council. So I've been on both sides of the, of the picture. Uh, the uh, 
budget process is an involved one, and uh, for the new counselors, they're going to find out how involved it is as, as time goes on and we get closer to the, uh, the budget hearings and the capital improvement plan. <clears throat> the capital improvement plan, uh, again, I worked on, I was a member of the, uh, for the police department, I was the representative for the uh, uh, capital improvement plan and uh, as Gordon mentioned, other people have mentioned the strategic plan. Uh, I personally had great difficulty sometimes with the strategic plan because as part of the evaluation for the capital improvement program, we had to apply the strategic plan to each and every single capital item. You know, uh, Is it necessary and how does it fit in with the strategic plan and the priorities of the council? And sometimes the strategic plans were very lofty ideals, but to put them in practice uh, as far as the day-to-day -day workings of the town was difficult. So I think we have to re-examine the strategic plan and where we want to go with that. Uh, some of the things that uh, we're working on are of great interest to me particularly uh, the short-term, the housing issues, the short-term rentals. Uh, the short-term rentals, I think, have been a detriment to, to the town. Uh, I, I loved uh, Felicia's statement that uh, we have motels that are being uh, used as housing and we have housing that are used, being used as motels. And I, I think that's very, very true. In my neighborhood in Austinville that I moved from a few years ago, uh, we, we saw that uh, several of the houses there were being converted to short-term rentals and it changes the whole uh, complexion of the neighborhood. It, it drastically changes when you have people coming and going uh, two or three times a week possibly or for a long weekend and they're there to celebrate a graduation or to celebrate uh, you know a bachelor party or a bachelorette party. Uh, it's not a plus for the neighborhood in any shape, manner, or form. Water and sewers, uh, I think, uh, are critical, critical issues for us, and not just because of the, uh, the fact that the Conservation Law Foundation is kind of holding our feet to the fire. Uh, we are literally killing ourselves with what we're putting into the ground. We see that with PFAS. Uh, we see that with the nitrogen loading with the uh, degradation of the uh, bays, the estuaries, the ponds. So I, I fully support uh, anything that we have to do as far as the soaring goes and the water issues. We have to preserve the water. I was very glad to see the uh, uh, CPC funding tonight for the uh, calm fire and uh, there's just so much work that has to be done on, on, the, wire, on the water. Uh, it's been mentioned about the agenda, and I won't go into that much, but I think there has to be more input into the agenda setting process, and I think the agenda has to be set earlier than it is now. I, I think we do a disservice to the counselors when they get uh, an agenda and the supporting information uh, 48 hours or, or so before a meeting. Uh, there's a lot of work and a lot of thought that should be put into the uh, articles and uh, a lot of background research that should be done and sometimes that's just not enough time. So I see my role as vice president to support the president and to support the council as a whole to do whatever needs to be done and I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tamish. Are there any speeches in support from any councillors? No? Okay. So we're going to get to the voting. Again, state the name of the person that you're voting for, starting with President Levesque. Star. Lightkey? Thomas. ST1. Mendes? Star. Neary? Uh, Councilor Star. Penn? Tamish. Schnepp? Star. 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 
Tamish. Tamish. Turkelson. Tamish. Bloom. Tamish. Burdick. Star. Clark. Tamish. Crow. Tamish. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Councillor Tamish, you, you are now our vice president. So I would like to congratulate both of you. And now I get to turn the, uh, the meeting right back over to you, uh, uh, President Penn. Um, and uh... um, I believe we have one more item on our agenda, and then we will... Um move on into the night and that is um approval of the town council calendar of meetings for 2024 um have all of you looked at that calendar of would like to make a recommendation i know i'm just supposed to run the meeting but i have a personal stake in this you can either have the meeting without me or we can in september i mean in october uh the jewish holidays happen to fall on conflict with the town council meetings um so i was wondering if any if it would conflict i don't see school vacations or anything here um they're currently scheduled for october 3rd and october 17th um the good news is october has five thursdays that month isn't that amazing how that works so um it would be possible to move the meetings to the 10th and the 24th is that a problem uh, for anybody here and or staff? We're good to go. Do you, demote, do you need a motion for that? or We might need to amend what was uh, given us. So why don't we do that? Could, could I also recommend that we change the 18th? Wait a minute. I'm, oh, no. Go ahead, Paula. I, I believe the um, second meeting in April does fall during school vacation week, and historically we move it to the 25th. We'd move it to the, the last Thursday. Okay, so. so if we're going to amend, I just wanted to add that one in. Okay, let's do that. Okay, let's do it all, all three of those meetings. So you don't want to move the fourth, so we're two weeks apart. You just want to move the second meeting in that month? Sure. sure. Yes. Yes, just moving the second meeting from the 18th to the 25th in April to avoid school vacation week. Do we need a motion for that? Attorney Nober, what would you? Okay. We could. Uh, yeah, so why don't we do a vote just so everybody's on the same page and we have it recorded in here, okay? So I would entertain a motion to move the April 18th meeting to the 25th and the October 3rd meeting to the 10th of October and the October 17th meeting to the 24th of October. So moved. So moved. Second. This is a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Indicate aye. aye. Anybody opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you for that. So, um, Madam President, before we adjourn, may I have the floor for a second? You certainly may. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just wanted to take the opportunity in our public venue to uh, give a, a, a hearty thanks to our president for the last three years, Matthew Levesque. Um, I know how much work and dedication you have put into this role. It's, it's tremendous. And... Um, you have big shoes to fill, <laughs> <laughs> Councilor, uh, President Penn. Thank you. No parting comments. We're done. Okay. Just um, quick parting comments is I need to thank my wife and children <laughs> uh, for allowing me and supporting me in the opportunity. Um, I can honestly say. I know it wasn't perfect, and uh, but I really did try my very best, and um, um, I learned a lot. Learned a lot about people. I learned about the needs of this community. 
Um, I learned that we need to go where people are. They don't necessarily can come to these meetings and we need to represent them just the same uh, because there's people very much struggling. Um, before this meeting, I went to the uh, services over at the uh, First Baptist Church uh, for the, um, the deceased uh, members of our community that were homeless and this past year in that mem memorial service. And so um, it's true that it's all a team effort and we're only, um, as, our chain is only as strong as our weakest link. So we have to help people and, um, and really um, lend a hand where we can. So, and um, really represent <clears throat> the full town of Barnstable as best we can. So I, uh, I appreciate it. And again, uh, thank you to all the counselors for that. Um, great. Um, uh, very touched by that, and I'm not <clears throat> typically um, a person of uh, few words, <laughs> but I am right now. So thank you very much, and uh, again, thanks to my wife and children for allowing me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the one, one more thing. Thank you to the wonderful staff. Thank you to town manager Mark Ells, Andy Kleiber, and Mark Milne, Elizabeth Jenkins, I can go on and on and on, Dan Santos, David Anthony. Yep, Karen Nober, um, Ruth Wild, you know, and all the, you know, Charlie and David Houghton, and Kathy, and, um, Kath and, and so I just, um, I just want to say thank you. I learned a lot from you. Um, I feel like in a lot of ways, I, I got an education, college education in three years. Thank you. All right, so we need a motion to Move adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second by Crowd. All in favor? <laughs>